Five years ago, I started my most ambitious project, hitting the reset button on the world and taking everything back to the beginning of human history. The goal? Start from the Stone Age and build all the technologies and tools needed to get myself into the Industrial Revolution. It introduced a few simple rules to roughly guide the journey. Both ingredients and tools will need to be made from scratch for me to use them. What won't be required to be made from scratch are things like safety equipment, my clothing, and just general protection from the elements. Must start from the naturally available resources or a near equivalent, and once a usable quantity is produced, it unlocks the future use of the resource. Getting large quantities of raw ores has been pretty difficult, I've found, and usually the best I can get is a small sample. This allows me to learn the process of extracting, making the metal, or other resource, and allows me to not have to smelt every single ounce of copper I need, or to milk a cow every time I need milk again. We have to do every step ourselves. Small tweak here is turning this from a solo endeavor into more of a team venture. As we venture into larger and larger projects, I've quickly learned it's not feasible to do it all myself, which makes sense since small levels of specialization were common even at the beginning of human history. Lastly, some shortcuts can be unlocked, as keeping the journey both authentic but feasible will be a thin line. Shortcuts would be like, once I successfully smelt and cast bronze using a primitive kiln, I can use a faster and cheaper modern propane forge for future bronze casting after that. Overall, I want the emphasis to be on learning and figuring out new skills to progress forward, not just doing the same process over and over again in a continual grind. In the subsequent five years, this ambitious project has taken many twists and turns and met some unexpected challenges. But now we move into the final and last stage of the series, unlocking the technologies to finally reach the steam engine. So I thought it'd be a good time to take a look back and revisit the journey we've taken so far to get to where we are now. My name is Andy, and this is How to Make Everything. The knowledge to unlock the steam engine required viewing the world in a whole new way. If you want to expand your understanding of the world and see what unlocks for you, consider today's sponsor, Brilliant. Ever find yourself stuck in a problem and wishing you could see it from a different angle? That's why I love Brilliant. It's not just about learning, it's about what learning unlocks. With Brilliant, you learn by doing. They've got thousands of interactive lessons that make complex topics like math, data analysis, programming, and AI click into place. What makes Brilliant truly special is how they build your understanding from the ground up. Each lesson is designed from hands-on problem solving, so you're not just memorizing. You're thinking critically and becoming a better problem solver. And the content, it's crafted by experts from MIT, Caltech, and beyond, making it six times more effective than just watching videos. Plus, Brilliant helps you build a powerful daily learning habit. In just minutes a day, you're learning personally and professionally, tuning your downtime into something truly meaningful. Check out Brilliant. Visit the link in the description to try out free for 30 days and get 20% off an annual premium subscription. The journey begins at the very basic, fire. One of the most important tools humanity developed was the control of fire. It allowed us to warm ourselves, cook our food, most importantly, use it to produce and extract crucial materials, ceramics, metals, and countless other compounds. The exact date humanity learned how to control and start their own fires is not well known, as most evidence has decayed away. But clues suggest it dates back, likely even before modern humans. We wanted to achieve this first milestone of humanity using two different methods, hitting two rocks together, and rubbing two sticks together. But before I start my fire, I'm gonna need some good candidates for some tinder. We collected some cattails, whose fluffy heads make a great fire starter, and to use for some upcoming basket weaving. So an early tool is fire making fire starting. It's commonly believed it was first utilized by just kind of finding an existing fire, either from like a forest fire or a lightning strike, and using that to start all your future fires. But eventually humanity figured out how to start actual fires. And it's not certain which methods were first used, but a commonly believed one is flint and iron pyrite. So striking the iron pyrite will decompose the chemical bond, releasing sulfur and iron. The iron will react with the air and start on fire basically oxidize, release a fair amount of heat. This is tinder fungus or hoof fungus, and this will light very easily, and make a nice starting ground. You can then add other tinder. Not catching anything though.
I did it! So the Flint and Pyrite fire took all together about five hours to start, which is not ideal, it's not very efficient, but that was also probably just I wasn't practiced at it. But we're going to try a little more foolproof of a method uh, by making a bow drill. This will be the friction plate, this will become the spindle, and the twine in this stick will be the bow. This little bowl I made I'm going to use as my capstone, which will help me press the spindle into the friction board for enough friction to actually start a fire. While Annalise managed to have success at these, I also want to make sure I could get a fire started too. But first, to make the fire more portable, once I have it lit, I'm going to make a simple torch just using pine resin. Now to get a fire lit so I can cook my catch. In the end, it took both of us a combined 12 and a half hours to finally master this fire starting skill. With this very first technology unlocked, fire, we now move on to some other crucial tools to get our civilization rebuilt. Stone tools and ceramics. My plan is to not get too deep into the Stone Age era of technology, as there are several other channels that do a much better job exploring this era. And something that will become very apparent is that trying to make anything using stone tools can be a pretty slow process. So I don't want to get stuck in the Stone Age, like humanity did for 99% of its existence. Some of the first stone tools that were made were made using a technique called flint napping, when flint or chert rocks were broken to form razor sharp edges. I've actually covered flint napping a couple times previously for making some basic tools and weapons, but I never really learned how to actually use them to shape wood. So while in England this spring, I met with a flint napper at Butzer Ancient Farm. Butzer Ancient Farm explores experimental archeology span and gives a chance for visitors to interact with various time periods in England, ranging from the Stone Age to the Anglo-Saxons. And they do a variety of events, including reenactment of Viking attacks. First, I met with a project coordinator Trevor. So Butts Ranch and Farm is uh, an experimental archaeological site and we have existed since about 1971. What we do is try and find out physically how things worked in the past, how things were built in the past. Then are there specific time ranges you limit yourself to? From about six or six and a half thousand years ago right through to about 1,300 years ago. So what we do is take any archaeological evidence we can find and try and reconstruct it in some way, shape or form. Using materials and technology 
technology that was available and that's really important. A lot of the time archaeology is very theoretical. What we have around now is not necessarily what they had then. Is there evidence of settlement here in the past? In this spot? Yeah. No, actually, that's one of the reasons we're here. We can dig and scrape and probe and not do any damage to any other archaeology. Then I met with a flitnapper, Mark. He wasn't killed for profit. He was killed out of revenge. <laughs> Flint is very old. It's between 70 million and 100 million years old and it's formed at the bottom of the sea. It mixes up with sands and over time becomes very hard. But because it's mixed up with that sand, it's quite glass-like. So when you hit it, if it's at the right angle with the right amount of force, it flakes will come off. So that's basically what flint napping is, the controlled removal of flakes. So if we were to just hit this there, we couldn't accurately predict how it's gonna break. But if we turned it around and we struck it from this angle, we can be sure that this will come off as long as there's no faults in there. But yeah, feel free if you um, wanna try and pick it up. <laughs> Hefty beast. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't wanna be doing it all day, would you? Yeah. Hit it around there. Hammer snow starts breaking. Excellent. Good. Good. That's nice. We'll keep that to one side. Nice. Lovely. See, I can tell you've done this before. <laughs> See, all of these things, they can become arrows in the, in the future, so it's always worth keeping anything aside that's good, even if it's not what you're planning on making. I would now look at um, turning this into a hand axe. At the moment, if we try to use this on wood, all that would happen would it, it would break. This is sharper than this, but you don't want it to be that sharp. This won't break if you're working wood, but this will. So basically what we want to do is start trying to round this off. So how many times have you done flint napping? Uh, two or three. Nice. Good. Good, so we've got an edge here that we would be able to start chopping through wood with. It's fairly easy to make, yeah. it's quick to make. In terms of the fancy um, hand axes that we show in museums in this country, that's just because it's at a point in the Neolithic where flint nappers are trying to demonstrate their skill to people. The same with barbed and tanged arrowheads. Someone in the Stone Age sitting down and trying to say, look how good I am. They've got the cutting edge, now they just want to make it as comfortable on their hands as possible so they start to get the shape. Yeah, that's good. So if you um, like sort of run your finger along there carefully, yeah. before it was very sharp but very brittle. Because you've taken that sharp edge out and tapered it out, it means that it's now strong. You could hit it on wood and it wouldn't break. So what we're going to do is, with these two pieces, put a serrated edge on there, kind of like a saw. It's really slow going through wood with these, but it does work. The downside of these is that those teeth break really easy and they become blunt very quickly. So whenever you're um, planning on cutting through some woods, you need to have loads of these ready. <laughs> We're using the same kind of tools that they would have used. Mm -hmm. It's slow going, they would have done it quicker, but it's still, if you had a modern saw, you'd be straight through that. Ways into the Copper Age, flint tools were still being used, right? The Copper Age was over in Europe, but not in this country. We skipped the Copper Age and went straight to the Bronze Age, but they're still using flint. The arrowheads in the Bronze Age are made of flint, barbed and tanged arrowheads. Mm -hmm. Still got ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one? Yeah. Yeah? Start like chopping in like that. Yet. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Still not there yet. <laughs> Do you want to try one of the other ones? Sure. Okay, let's try with that one. Is that working better? I think so. See, fancy doesn't mean better. <laughs> it just look better. Makes you appreciate all the work that went into surviving yeah. in the Stone Age. Because everything takes a long time. Did it. <laughs> we'll save there. So if you start banging that in, mm -hmm. let's see if you can split it down there. You put the hatchet blade through there mm -hmm. and then bind up the end. So when ancient people are going through like lots of um, brushlands, then they can cut through. All right, you ready to go into the woods? Sure. So we've got these two edges here. Mm -hmm. 
borings used for carving wood. Bone will get you to carve your name in there. See how well they work. The Neanderthals especially, when theirs broke, they just used the pressure flaker and retouched them to put another edge on there and then carried on. They nearly all have evidence of um, retouching on there. So when you think of like the Lion Man statue, and that's made out of mammoth bone, it makes you realise how much work went into that one statue. It would, never would have been completed by one person. It would have taken more than a lifetime to complete it, so it would have been a generation thing. You've got a friend in me. The ideal piece, you want it to have a thick back because that would be the end that you're going to hit. If it's too thin, then it will just crumble and wouldn't work properly. So basically what you want to do, have that there and then start hitting it. You want to start off quite gentle at first, um, just until it's made a bit of a groove. And then when it's in there, then you can start really hitting it and splitting it down there. What you can do to speed this process up um, with this, the saw that you made, you can start off that line that you need with one of those. It's the start of it that takes all the time. And then once, once you hear um, the first bit split, then it's just a case of hitting it harder and it goes through. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, there is a reason that the Stone Age ended. <laughs> the Bronze Age took over. So when it's far enough in that it will split the wood slightly, mm -hmm. that's when suddenly the progress speeds right up. So if that works. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed you managed to split that all the yeah. way through. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> so the reality of it is that it's a really easy thing to do if you've got modern tools. Yeah. You could, we could give you um, a hatchet and you'd be through that within three seconds. Now, if you're out in the woods and you find a bit of flint and you need to have split wood like that, you'd be able to do it. Yeah. It's going to take you time. Yeah. But in the Stone Age, you're not the only person. There's a tribe of you. So if you need lots of those, then just lots of you are going to be making them. It's the same with the flint napping. If someone's good at one thing, but not so good at another, they're all, they're all mucking in to, to get the job done. So today you've, you've gone back in time and got in touch with your ancestors because they would have been doing things like you've done today. And I just think the only way we can really understand the people of the past is to do the things that they did because otherwise we can never appreciate the skill and the time and patience involved. What are you doing? <laughs> Back home, it's time to put this new set of flint tools to work. This way. Heal. That way. To make the next tool I'll need. All right, so I have the rock that I flint napped in the United Kingdom, and now I'm going to use it to make some other tools, specifically a uh, digging stick, which is going to help me loosen up earth and collect some clay, which will be very useful for a variety of things, most importantly, getting to the Bronze Age. I also have a cat. Dangerous to go into the woods alone. Make sure you bring your cat for protection. Dubby leads the way. She's uh, a trained stick finder. Which way, Dubby? Oh, want some of this? What is it? Is this what I think it is? There's a whole field of it. Come on, come on, Dubby. Ow. This one, this is the one. This one should be pretty good. Hopefully, I just gotta cut it. It is making decent progress. Should be easy to debark this guy. Close to halfway now. Might be ready to break. Not quite a clean break. Yeah. 
Nice. I actually did what I thought it might. <laughs> do some digging. This way. Ow. Let go. Digging stick is pretty similar to just a spear that can be used to break up earth, but sometimes it can have a flat tip, so it can also function more like a shovel. I did it! I made a stick. You made a stick. Okay. Once roughly shaped, it's fire hardened over some coals and any burnt off portions that scraped off. Let's go dig some clay. But first, I'll need something to carry the clay on. Then, after digging in a few areas, I found a really promising spot. Interesting color. Well, yeah, it shouldn't be. It's... That feels like some good clay. The digging stick proved to be very helpful in breaking up the dirt, roots, and random rocks. Holds form really nicely. Yeah. I think that should be enough for now. I don't know. <laughs> Take that bag and start processing it. Ugh. Then I process the dry clay by breaking it up and picking out any rocks and other debris. All right, so I got my clay ground up to a relatively fine powder, removed all the solid rocks, except for this one. Should hopefully be ready to make it into something. So I got a bottle gourd I grew a few years ago, one of the earliest containers used for transporting water. It's a little deformed. I'm gonna take some of my flint tools, wind up the hole, fill it up with some water, and mix it with the clay powder, shape it into a small bowl. Let's make some clay. All right, got this guy cleaned out. Gotta take it down to the river, get some water. Three D printing. <laughs> All right, so I made a little primitive bowl here. So now I just gotta let it dry out and bake it in the fire. And Annalise make a few duplicate pots as backups as well. Then warm the pot by the fire. It sticks. Before burying them in the coals. Like this. Well, so then they sit like that for a little bit. Burning down the fire several times on top of them. Lastly, it's buried and left for the night. In the morning, we dig them out. The hawk? 
Not hot, maybe a little warm. Oh, there's a, hey, it is solid. Did not break. That sounds like it fired. Yeah, success. Hey, hey. After the fire last night, this is the end results of my pottery. And it actually turned out pretty nice. I was a little worried it might end up breaking. It's a fairly decent chance when you'd use that method. And I uh, got this little container, should hold stuff. All right, so here's the uh, modest collection of tools I've been able to produce for this first episode. And at this point, I'm mostly just building the building blocks to make future things. Right here, doesn't look like much, but it represents 25,000 years of human progress. That's what it took to get from stone tools to ceramics. So one major leap. Ceramics is very versatile. It can make a lot of cooking materials, a variety of different holding containers that I'm not so limited to just gourds I'm able to grow myself. I can cook stuff over a fire or I can use it as a crucible for when it comes to metal smelting or even as a mold. So in terms of actual cost to produce each of these items, is all labor. So the overall production cost for these was pretty low. The flint in total took about three hours. That's so about $24 for this tool set. Not a bad deal. The clay and the whole processing of that took 10 hours. So that's about $77. So in total, that's 13 hours, about $101. So pretty modest at this beginning, but uh, we'll be going up from there for sure. Definitely not gonna stay that reasonable. So now that I've gotten a hang of some of these initial fundamental skills, the next step I wanna get into is actual metals, which will speed things up a lot because flint tools, well sharp, are not the fastest. So in the next episode, we're gonna advance into the next age, which was after the Stone Age, which is the Copper Age. And the easiest way to get a metal is to just find it on the ground. So we went to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, one of the areas with the most abundant supply of native copper, and then work it in some primitive tools that I can use for building some bigger things specifically a dugout boat. Next, we fast forward ahead 16,000 years to roughly 9,000 BCE to get ourselves out of the Stone Age and into metals with humanity's very first metal, copper. Copper is one of the few metals that can be found in its native form, just as a chunk of copper metal. Because of this, copper is believed to be the first metal humanity discovered and learned to craft, with evidence of its first use starting around 9,000 BCE. As a relatively soft metal, it can be hammered with stones and shaped into various tools and decorative objects. Previously, I traveled to California to collect a low-grade copper ore, which required a pretty sophisticated process to actually extract the copper metal. However, the largest supply of native, ready-to-use copper is actually a lot closer to me in the Keweenaw Peninsula in Michigan. So we took a short trip out to collect some of this very initial copper and got to have a bit of an adventure at Adventure Mine. But first, for a different kind of adventure, Check out today's sponsor. At Adventure Mine, met up with the owner, Matt, and one of the tour guides, Mike. But this was one of the few places that they could find copper in its native form without having to smelt it. And what it is, there was a big fissure out in the middle of which is now Lake Superior. And this pulled apart. And when it pulled apart, it allowed the, the magma to flow up freely. It was more than a volcanic eruption. It actually flooded the area 80 to 120 feet deep in molten lava. As it cools, a couple things happen. The gases float up to the top. And as it cools, the rock shifts, creating these passive ways through it. At some point, these voids that were left by the gaseous exhaust from the lava flows, that would be filled with copper and other minerals through time. All the water deep in the earth was superheated by this magma. Superheated water will readily pick up copper and other minerals. As it does so, the pressure and the heat move it up towards the surface. As it cools, it percolates down through and through the millions, if not billions of years, it leaves a little bit of this copper and other elements behind, slowly filling in these voids left by the gases. And at this point, the mountain actually sheared and came up like this. Long after that happened, the Ice Age came along. Mile-thick masses of ice here came through, and this is where they actually gouged that copper 
out of the earth. It was pushed along with the till from the glaciers. The glaciers receded. That's where all the float copper came from. It's this float copper that is the most accessible and can be found all around the Keweenaw Peninsula in Michigan. However, after centuries of humans finding and collecting these chunks of native copper, they are now much rarer to find. To attempt to find some, Mike actually knew an area where he's had some luck finding float copper himself. Since most of this easily accessible copper has been readily collected already, we used the help of a metal detector to help us find the more rare ones that are left. Mike, this is a, an area you said you've been able to find float copper before? We've had limited success. It's uh, They've been doing this for many years, so we're looking for kind of the leftovers from all the people that have gone before us. But the glaciers pushed everything more or less south, and as they receded, they left that till that left some float copper in it. So we tend to look on the southern banks of things. It's our most likely place to find things. So we can head off in the woods, run down a few ridges, and never know, maybe we'll find a piece today. All right, let's give it a shot. Okay, a lot of people think it settles in the low grounds and the streams and stuff. I found mine more in this type of area right here. We got something there, but let's see what it is. So the numbers aren't high enough. You have to be at least 75. So it's probably an old beer can buried in there. If you get a number of 75, 80 or above and it beeps in both directions, then you're pretty sure of finding some copper. The other thing I tend to do is try to get over by trees and off the path a little, thinking that over the years, many people have metal detected here. So now you're kind of looking for the crumbs, which means the less obvious places. How long of sessions usually do this for? Uh, my buddy and I go out every Thursday and we'll go for probably about three hours. How often do you find something? We usually find something. Let's see if we're getting anything. Yeah, 50s and 60s, so it's just junk. What number are you getting? 92. 92, that's, let me brush the brush away, see if we're still hearing something. Are you still getting 90s? Yeah. I'd say you got a good chance. That's the color you're looking for right there. Is that it? It's gotta be. Distinctive green, the oxidization. So that's float copper? That's float copper. After a few hours of searching, we lucked out and found some copper. To have a few more options to work with, I also purchased a few more chunks of float copper others had found in the area. Next, we started searching for some of the deeper buried copper at some of the prehistoric mining sites. These are prehistoric, they've been since mined historically, but there is a pit which is, I think best place to see it, up here on top of that bluff that's, it's gonna be as much untouched prehistoric as you're gonna find anywhere. Hey, there's a, there's a lot of different opinions, but it looks like prehistoric mining about 4,500 years ago to roughly 8,500 years ago. Primitive mining was done a couple of different ways. Some was top down on these pits. Many of them were in pits like this. This. The copper after the big upheaval were literally sticking out of the ground. They'd been buried by millions if not billions of years of debris, but they still found these spots and where the fissures actually came out of the mountains is where they went down in, sometimes up to 20 feet deep as they followed the fissure down into the rock. They were rather limited to how far they could go because of the technology of the day. Many people think they built big fires and then they would throw water to rapidly cool the basalt that would fracture it, make it easier to break off. They could get in there with their stone tools and things and peen off pieces. Many times they couldn't extricate the whole masses of copper. They had to settle for just basically breaking off the pieces that they could harvest. They use those for tools, jewelry, other things. If you find copper, what you're looking for is crest toothpaste, if that helps you any. Yeah, yeah there's copper right there, you got it. Yeah. See, it's all in this calcite seam and it wraps over here too, so. I... Next, we went down into the main mine to explore some of the more modern extractions of copper. The Adventure Mine was mined from 1850 to about 1920. Uh, by the way, the Adventure is the original name. There actually was a town site called Adventure in the 1840s. Uh, when the company came, they took the Adventure name. It is still the largest known reserve of copper any place in the whole world. You want to lead? No. Okay. Almost all of our early miners were Cornish. Uh, times were tough in England. They were hard rock miners there, some of it copper, a lot of it tin, but they understood the technique for drilling and blasting in this this environment. This was a fracture zone or a crack. You got the green epidote, white is quartz and calcite. You got the copper, you have silver, and that came in filled in all these places with these minerals over a long period of time. Ready? Yep.
If we look at a drill hole here, we actually hit a piece of copper. You know, having all this copper sounds great, but actually the, the big chunks of copper are really hard to mine. When they mined this historically in like the 1800s, very labor intensive, hand drills and, and sledgehammers. Yeah, the opening you're looking at up there is about five or six feet by almost 12 feet. It's 250 feet up. Because of the, the stope you're looking up, it makes it look much, much closer, but it's a very long ways. That's actually the top of the mountain where the modern era mine intersected with an old prehistoric pit. And actually some of the rubble from the prehistoric pit then fell into the modern, modern era mine. I actually found a prehistoric copper knife blade up there rummaging around up there. Had the knife dated at roughly seven to 8,000 years old. The prehistorics also make tools and other things out of the float copper that was relatively readily available. So they, they harvested a lot of that. The other thing that they sometimes would find, there'd be rocks with real thin fissure copper in between it. And what it is is a crack so small where the copper filled it in, if you break away part of the rock, the copper that comes out is already a sheet of copper, which makes it relatively easy to make jewelry or implements out of it. So if you get real adventurous, we'd take you to level two is the only place I know right and find you some of that today. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty easy, even one-handed, but you be the judge. There's 13 levels of the mine. Uh, they're about 100 feet per level. Uh, we have access to the first level, which is about, uh, about a mile from one end to the other. I guess the is probably about seven to eight miles of tunnels in the entire complex here. But unfortunately, those bottom 11 levels are underwater. Now, as we're going lower, you can't get too much access yet, but everything we're seeing is nobody's seen that for the past 110 years. So it's basically left as it was. And you walk down there, you'd, you'd find something like pickaxes or, or hammers leaning against timbers, just like you can tell nobody's touched that. Somebody, some miner set that down yeah. and then they closed the mine. He never came back, and that's been sitting leaning against that timber for the past 110 years. Everything like a time capsule of, mm -hmm. of how the miners walked away when they stopped working one day. This is what they call a, a native hatchet. It just exists in the mine. You just dig it out. It's ready to use. But just so you know, this isn't safe here. Let's just see if we have any luck breaking rock loose around it. But there's a little piece. I'm hoping there's a big mass of it in there. But you can see how the prehistorics could have exploited thin fissure copper like this and got enough out to work. Copper, when it oxidizes, turns green, like the Statue of Liberty. But then unlike ferrous metals, where it keeps cutting into it, it forms this kind of skin over it that will never erode after that. That's why we can find thousands of year old tools perfectly preserved because the copper oxidization creates a protective layer over it. I was hitting some good soft stuff up in here. We might start working on that piece. we get a decent chunk out of there by the time you're done. Run. There you go, that's not a bad chunk. Now with a few pieces of copper I can work with, I can take them back and start cold working them. Back home with the copper, now it's time to start shaping these chunks into some usable tools. Copper, <laughs> rock. Working the copper causes it to harden as you go until it reaches the point of starting to crack and break. To prevent this, you need to heat it up and release the stress in a process called annealing. Then you can continue to cold work it more. And then you keep repeating until it's formed its desired shape. Once I have a rough blade shape, I can then be sharpened by rubbing it on some coarse stones. And then working my way to finer and finer grain stones. As I start to near completion, I actually want to make sure the copper is under stress still and hasn't been annealed, as that will leave it with a much harder edge. This is called work hardening. Now I just need to attach it to a handle. Kind of aiming for an OC style axe, even though his was actually cast copper. I'm going to try and get something close to what he used for a handle, which is kind of a, a stick with a 90 degree end to it. This stick here, it's got a 90 degree branch right there, it might work well. See if I can cut this with the axe head. You can already tell, copper is a lot easier than stone. Tough tree. 
All right, and I'm bleeding. Cool. All right, here's a stick. Just gotta get this mounted in there. See if we can find ones that look a little bit better. The alternative. All right, so I got a couple options. So far, first impressions, the copper works pretty good cutting, but a handle would make a big difference. I feel like I can't get enough force, and when I give it any force, it really hurts your hand. So a handle is gonna be very nice. All right, so here's the hemp we accidentally stumbled upon last time. It, uh, I'm assuming it's hemp. Hemp was growing here at, during World War II in Minnesota, and most wild varieties you find today are just leftover hemp. And hemp's a pretty sturdy plant. Actual marijuana that you would smoke is not too sturdy. This could be marijuana. This could be like a private garden. Somebody's been trying to grow here on public land. Hopefully not, because I'm about to cut some of it. Either way, the stock should make some decent fibers for making rope. Just de-leaf them so they look less suspicious. <laughs> to make rope out of hemp, I first soak the stalks in water, then remove the fibrous exterior from its hard inner core. Then lay out the fibers and turn them into a rope by twisting them together to form two strands, combining to form a basic rope. To help hold everything in place, I used some pine sap I collected earlier to help glue it together onto the hemp rope. After making the axe, I then made an adze with the blade rotated 90 degrees, another useful tool for shaping wood. All right, so now I've officially left the Stone Age. I have an ax and an adz, both made from a copper. And already I can tell the copper has made a pretty big difference in my ability to cut things versus the flint. It has uh, a lot more resilience, so I can hit it a lot harder and get much deeper cuts. However, I have noticed that it dulls very easily and just cutting the wood to make the handle, I had to resharpen it. And at this point, it's probably about due for a new sharpening. It's nowhere near modern steel. It's definitely an improvement, but it's not great. And it's easy to tell why once bronze was figured out, they quickly replaced copper. When you look at some of the historical artifacts that are found from this era, it's very impressive. It's obviously people who have learned a skill that I am just starting at. Kind of understandable minds not quite as good. These new tools should hopefully make building anything else in the future a lot easier. All right, so now that I have some metal tools, next up I can try and actually make some more advanced woodworking projects. The next major project we're gonna be pursuing is one of the earliest forms of transportation, dugout canoe. The first step of that is going to be to cut down a tree. So we're gonna put copper to the test against flint, see which one can cut down a tree quicker. We're also gonna do a, another form made by just grinding a stone into a sharpened edge. Potentially it might be better than the copper. Copper's pretty soft, it's a pretty small blade, and the ground stone is actually pretty effective. All right, then in terms of hours of labor to actually make them, seven hours and 15 minutes to make this guy, paying someone minimum wage, it's about $60, and six hours and 45 minutes to make this one, and this is about 55. With this first form of metal, we can now begin to leave the Stone Age and unlock some more advanced tools. But sometimes older tools can still be more effective. So we explore that next by trying to recreate a ground stone axe. 
it's time to start building some more major projects using these base tools I've now constructed. Specifically, a bow and arrow and a dugout canoe. And for that, the first major challenge I'm gonna face is needing to cut some pretty sizable trees. So while I was making flint and copper tools, I had Annalise working on a second type of stone tool that became common later after chipped flint tools, but shortly before humanity started to use copper, a salt or ground stone ax. Becoming popular in the Neolithic era sometime around 10,000 BCE, they proved to be a powerful tool for felling trees and clearing land. A bit more time consuming to produce, they are made by grinding a stone into a blade shape rather than chipping it, offering a more resilient cutting tool. But first, I need to find the perfect tree for my bow. It's one of the hunt right now for a good tree for the bow. There's a few different options. Hickory would probably be ideal for this area. Otherwise there's elm, ash, maple. Any of those would probably be a decent bow. On the hunt looking for a bow. Really? What were you gonna say before about it? <laughs> Just find money? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I don't have more money. <laughs> Let's... Dude, split it with me. <laughs> it's like 75 bucks. Just don't. <laughs> they say money doesn't grow on trees. It's just, just right there. <laughs> it's just $75 in cash and a fishing pole. I don't know, is this like a trap? <laughs> what? It's a weird forest we're in. All right, so we just gained an anonymous $75 patron. So thanks for that. While I finish my hunt for the perfect tree, let's see how Annalise is doing on the stone ax. I'm gonna take this rock and turn it into an ax. I'll be using a pecking and grinding method with these hammer stones and this granite rock. I'm gonna hopefully shape this edge into a 45 degree angle that will turn it into an ax head once we put it in a handle. Copper being such a soft metal, I'm a little skeptical my tools are going to be adequate. So if they prove to be ineffective, this should be a good backup. I've ground down the stone into an axe head. I used it to cut the end here, and it worked pretty good. All right, so I went around the forest trying to find an ideal tree for a bow, and came across this elm, which looks really promising. Super straight. It's got a few small knots, but not many. It's fairly thick. I think about six inches in diameter, which should give us enough material to make a few different staves from, potentially make a few bows. The real challenge is gonna be cutting it down now because it's pretty big and I only have copper tools to use. This blade is about the same size as Otzi's, which is known for being a pretty effective tool for the arrows in. I have my doubts how well it'll work for actually cutting down a tree. And as a backup, I have Annalise making a stone ax that might work better. A little bit awkward. Crooked, it makes it hard to swing accurately. Doing pretty good, but it's pretty slow. The biggest issue I'm running into is just the integrity of the actual tools I made. It's starting to bend outward. I think that's because the stick was not a complete 90. It's up a little bit, so when I strike it, it pushes it and causing it to fall apart. So I wish I had been able to find some better sticks. Probably would have gotten a better result with this. So I'm gonna take it back, retune them, and hopefully get a little bit better result. I don't like half an inch. So now I'm going to create the hole in this half for the ax head to fit in. I've started it with this piece of flint to make this notch and I'll just put an ember in this and then keep feeding it oxygen until it burns all the way through and I'll have the start of a hole that I can then continue to widen until the stone ax head fits. I'm just chipping out the burnt stuff. So it took a couple hours, but I've burned through the log, and now I just need to focus on getting the uh, hole wide enough for the rock to fit in. But there's a herd of turkeys, and I'm gonna go chase them first. <laughs> We're gonna go chase turkeys? Yeah. Where are the turkeys? They're over there. 
turkeys. I love turkeys, they're so dumb. I'm gonna catch this one, Dan. Wanna go chase him, Dan? I'll hold the camera. No. So just gently bother a flock of turkeys, but don't hurt them. All right, I've managed to burn all the way through the log now. So I'll just keep using uh, embers to burn out the rest of the hole until the rock fits. And then once I wedge it in, we'll have an ax. Oh, I keep losing my rock. So now we have an ax. Introducing a stick 2.0. It's bigger, it's straighter, and it's stronger. A little bit more support for the blade, so it should hopefully not move as much. And I took a suggestion from the comments of adding some charcoal to the pine pitch and make it more of a glue, so hopefully that holds a little bit stronger. It's working. Easier to swing. And for reference, I brought the flint. Show what that would look like. Got this bit that is still a little sharp. Yeah, so it's very slow. Definitely improvement, so we aren't going backwards. Can't do it. Let's start a new tree. This one just doesn't want to go. Ah, got it. Oh, that was a lot of work. At the same time, a lot easier than expected. A good stick makes a huge difference. Can't believe I cut that with just a piece of copper. That was surprisingly effective. I have a lot more respect for Otzi. He's got a, he's got a pretty good tool. After cutting the tree with copper in a little over an hour, I tried out Annalise's stone axe next to cut it to size. Oh sh <laughs> All right, stick broke. I just have to finish it by hand and uh, see how long that takes and make a new stick later. So far it seems to be working pretty good though. This might slow down a bit. There we go. <sighs> Got it. Whew. With the upcoming boat project, some more tools I'll need are a few sets of wedges to help split the log. So I took a few more pieces of the flow copper we got in Michigan and cold work them and sharpen them into some rough wedges. Oh, I cracked the rock. Oh no! Next up, I need to get the tree for my dugout canoe. In preparation, I've seen that this process can be incredibly slow going, even with modern steel tools, which I don't have. However, I think there are two important things that I can do that should hopefully speed up the process. First, using a dead and dried tree instead of a freshly cut one so that it'll burn easily and I can let the fire do the majority of the work. And by not being overly ambitious on the size of my canoe. For my inspiration, I'm pulling from what is believed to be the oldest dugout canoe, the Pessa Canoe, made from a Scots pine around 8000 BCE, which is roughly 17 inches in diameter. Trying to find a tree with these exact parameters was a bit of a challenge, but eventually found a really good candidate up near Duluth. Okay, we're up at my brother's property and he has this down pine tree that is probably the best candidate we've been able to find for a possible dugout canoe. It blew down a windstorm a few years ago and has been drying out since and hopefully is 
not rotten too much. So we're gonna delimb the tree, cut it to size, drop it down, split off the top third, and start burning. Hope we can do it with the tools we have. I'm gonna hit it with a stick. Good plan. Oh wow, that one takes a bite. I think that's holding. <laughs> Still might be better than the copper, actually. Just cause it's getting deep chunks. Yes. All right, so the hole is a little too big, so the rock kept falling out. There's a little piece of wood in there, and uh, seems to be doing the trick. So hopefully the rest of the wood doesn't break. And uh, this is actually working out pretty good. I think it's doing better than the copper is just because I can get a lot more of a swing. It's got a lot more weight, so you get a lot more penetration and take out some deeper cuts. So, uh, don't age, not too bad. Oh, did we get a crack? <sighs> it cuts well, but not super deep. I think this guy's holding it up. If I cut it out, I put a little bit, just enough pressure on it to snap it, hopefully. I feel like it's really close. I don't want to get too close and have it snap unexpectedly because it's a lot of weight that could kill somebody. So let's see if this does it. I want to move further away. Move just a little bit more. Oh yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> it fell over. All right. Now to debark it. So it took pretty much all day. I finally got the tree down, got a good way through it with the copper and the stone. Still not really sure if copper or stone works better. It seems the handle makes a huge difference and the handle on one needs some improvement. It broke off. The copper is pretty sharp and it can cut, but it can't go super deep. So uh, I'm still not certain which one is actually better. But we got through and now we have the log ready to be turned into a boat. We debarked it. Got started trying to split it with some of the wedges I made, but they uh, not splitting too well. I think it's a little too wet. Just gonna let it dry out the next week. Come back, split it, start a fire, and burn our way through.
full of ants. Hope they're ready for a voyage. Don't break our boat. So hopefully it's not too heavy and we can get it out to where we're gonna burn it. Now we're entering about hour eight of the burn. Now comes the little bit more difficult part of making sure we don't burn too much and burn holes in it. I think we're on track to finishing early actually. Those might be famous last words. So at the very least, if this doesn't work as a canoe, it'll work as a coffin. A month ago, I started the reset of our channel with a new challenge of rebuilding myself chronologically from the start of human history, exploring the question of if an average person with a basic understanding of humanity's history and base concepts could rebuild themselves back up to modern society. Up to now, I've learned the skills to produce and acquired the resources for a few basic tools. Now to apply them to our largest project yet, a form of transportation. Crossing large bodies of water has been a crucial development of humanity that allowed us to spread around the world even to isolated regions like Australia and the numerous islands of the Pacific. When the first boat was invented and how exactly it was built are relatively unknown. However, the earliest recovered boat is a dugout dating back around 8000 BCE, the Pesa Canoe. Dugout canoes developed pretty much everywhere in the world where large trees grow and have a long history of use even through to today. Their size and complexity can vary dramatically, but all are built on the same concept of hollowing out a single tree. Well, likely one of the first forms of boats made they are far from easy to produce and are well known for being very time consuming, potentially taking up several weeks to complete, even with more modern tools. While I was in England, I visited archaeological farm Bunser Farm to learn flint napping in my previous video and copper smelting in an upcoming one. I also got to see a few of their dugouts that they've produced and learn a few of their tips. This one's made from Scots pine. We tested tools from all different time periods on this to see the rate of progress. Um, but there was a lot of moisture when we'd done this. It had only been down about two years, so the fire didn't work too well on there. I had to spend a week living in a shelter like that because we wanted to keep the fire going for a whole week, so we took turns. When it starts to split, you could mix up pine resin with beeswax and charcoal over a fire. It's basically Stone Age glue. Then this one over here, this is oak. We used fire to hollow it out, so what we did was we put wet clay around the edges, put a fire on there, let it go down a little bit, chipped away the charred area, so it basically just made the work so much easier. Having seemingly simple projects turned to long, drawn-out endeavors has kind of been a staple of mine. So I want to nip this in the bud and get it done in the least amount of time possible. So my plan is to build a conservatively small boat, inspired by the Pesa canoe, using the most efficient tool to shape it, fire. Finding just the right tree was the biggest challenge, something that is certainly more difficult today than it would have been 10,000 years ago. After a few less than ideal possibilities, the best option we had was a dead pine on my brother's property in Duluth that had blown over several years ago. So in our last video, we prepped the tree by cutting it to size and stripping it of bark, now to turn it into the actual boat. But first, I had Annalise do a small scale prototype canoe to test run our strategy and see if there are any tools or other things we might need to do first. Looks more catnip in here. Continues to be your favorite place to be. Let's uh, see how this goes. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. We're sailing. You good. It's too far to jump, babe. It's too far to jump. We're not leaking. We got some over the side just because she tilted it once. Oh god, she's going to jump. <laughs> Let's go over what tools I've already made and have at my disposal and what else I'll need. I have the native copper axe, native copper adds, a stone axe, although it's out of commission, and some native copper wedges. Some additional wedges will likely be useful to split such a long log, so we put together a few other options using pieces of antler and wood. We also assembled a second adze using an antler piece as well. Now for the first step, splitting off the top portion of the boat. With no prior boat making experience, this process is going to be mostly learned through trial and error, and by trying to best match the known example of the Pesa canoe. Get out of my way. However, there are a few issues. 
my log is unfortunately a few inches narrower than the Pesa canoe, and as a modern human, I'm considerably larger than what an average human would have been around 10,000 years ago. But because I have no other options for a tree, I'm likely going to be working with some pretty thin margins here. my stick. I can just rip this off. Ah, it's already hollow. <laughs> Full of ants. Ah, hope they're ready for a voyage. This is actually gonna speed things up a lot. This part's pretty solid outside of it. I'm gonna bring my uh, digging stick down here today. Oh, no, watch up, watch up. Right hey, we're gonna tip this over. There we go. Let's this. Don't break our boat. So we got, got, oh boy. <laughs> got the top third of it cut open. Found out like the part I actually wanted to sit in is already pretty much hollow. So now we just gotta, gotta drag this out of the woods to where we're gonna burn it and uh, burn out the rest. We we're gonna burn it to size, try to cut it a bit long so we had extra in case this was too rotten. So hopefully it's not too heavy and we can get it out to where we're gonna burn it. Alright, so it took five of us, but we were able to haul this guy out of the woods into this clearing where we can now start to burn it. And it actually ended up being fairly rotten on the inside. We've been clearing it out with the ads and other copper tools, chipped out all of the rotten bits, and I think it's actually going to help us a lot because it's just on the inside, and the outside still seems completely solid. So it's probably saved us a good many hours of burning. Hopefully the outside holds up so far, it looks pretty solid. Next we're going to start the fire, move it into here. But because some parts of it are really close to the desired width, I'm going to take some of the clay and pack it around all the thin parts to protect it from the fire. So that should uh, allow us to kind of control the fire evenly so I can fit inside of it and hopefully float. entering about hour eight of the burn and we've made some pretty significant progress. I'm on the third shift so far and we got most of this end burnt off. Pretty decent groove done the whole thing so far. So we gotta deepen it a little bit and then widen it wherever I'm gonna sit. Right now it's pretty tight but hopefully we can uh, expand it a little bit. Now comes the a little bit more difficult part of making sure we don't burn too much and burn holes in it. There's already a, a few holes I can tell just from knots and stuff that we'll have to patch but that shouldn't be an issue. I think we're on track to finishing early actually. Those might be famous last words.
turn it. Probably about a 50 50 chance it's gonna float. <laughs> My fingers are burning. Alright, so I got this piece we split off from the top of the canoe. I'm going to chip it down, try and make some sort of paddle out of it. We got the completed boat, got patched up. Seems promising, haven't tested it in water, so now we're going to. It's uh, a little narrow, I can't really sit, but I can kneel. Uh, Lake Superior, beautiful sunny day. I haven't invented any navigational equipment yet. It's too foggy to see the sun or the stars, so I'm gonna be going completely blind and alone, so sure I'll be fine. So at the very least, if this doesn't work as a canoe, it'll work as a coffin. Well, it's a partial success. We made a boat. It actually floats pretty good. It has a couple small leaks that uh, uh, slowly takes on water, but nothing you couldn't bail out as you're going. And for a small child, it works pretty good. But for me, it's uh, yeah. kind of the biggest issue is just the shape of the tree and the overall size of it. Unfortunately, we had a very limited option of what we could find. So this is the best we could get, and it falls a little bit short. We have a narrow point on one end, and the spot we burned a little too much on this end, and uh, it's kind of difficult to balance between the two without taking in a bunch of water and sinking. But it holds a small child. We can actually use it as a boat. Unfortunately, the combination of the narrower sides not allowing me to sit lower in the boat, and my extra height just made the boat extra top-heavy and tip immediately when I tried to use it. It's a very refreshing dip in the lake. So in an upcoming video, I'll be making further improvements to make it more seaworthy for someone of my size. Adding some outriggers for better stability, as well as thinning the walls further so that it's lighter than rides higher in the water. And some additional patching and sealing of the wood with pine pitch. Then I should hopefully be able to utilize this boat with another technology, fishing. So how much did it cost? Counting for all the labor, including the initial cutting of the tree, it took a total of 43 hours to make it. But it also utilized all of the previous tools I made, including the pottery, which took 13 hours to make, 
the native copper axe and adze, which took 14 hours, and the stone axe of 45 hours. So to make this boat, including making all the tools, it took 115 hours, or at minimum wage, $920. Next up, we want to advance our metallurgic knowledge by mastering the first metal believed to be smelted from ore, which eventually paved our understanding for making bronze, lead. One of humanity's most important discoveries was how to make the metals we crafted in Smith into our exact needs. Previously, I've covered what was likely one of the first metals humanity learned to craft, native copper. Copper that already exists in its pure state and just needs to be cold worked. Over native forms of metal are pretty rare in most places of the world. Most often metals are found combined with other elements in various mineral compounds. Learning how to break these compounds down and extract just the metallic element, a process called smelting, was a skill that was slowly learned over thousands of years and was what allowed humanity to advance first into the Bronze Age and then into the Iron Age. However, the very first metal to be smelted was likely none of those but lead. The oldest evidence of smelting dates to about 6500 BC of cast lead beads. So before moving into copper and tin smelting, I first wanted to try to learn a bit about this metal and its history, try and source some of its raw ore, called galena, and even try a very, very carefully controlled smelting of it. So where do you find galena, the ore of lead? Well, an easy way is to go to the city that's named after it, such as the city of galena. Uh, the one in Illinois, in the tri-state area. This area where Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa meet are best known for their historical lead deposits that help shape their history. So first, I visited a few locations to see if I could locate any galena around old dig sites and mines. Found a so-called badger hole where miners would sometimes dig up some of the lead and build a makeshift shelter over it. So I'm gonna dig down, see if we can find any leftover lead. So far, I've just found some flint. Some nice clay. Charcoal. Yeah, somebody lived here. Uh, I think that's a bust. All right, so I went up the Mississippi River here, supposedly one of the old mines, and found one here. You wanna hop down there? I don't know. It's blocked off, like most of them are. I don't know if we're gonna be able to get much here. I don't see much in there. Mostly there's a waste rock and some glass. I think I'm just gonna look in the area, see if there's any, any small deposits left, either in the cliff wall or in any of the rocks on the ground, so you can find at least a small amount of lead. Might be a little difficult, there doesn't seem to be much lead left actually in this area. Got some antlers. This is what was first used to pickaxe at stone, dig, and mine. See if I can loosen up maybe a chunk of lead somewhere in this. An issue I continuously run into when attempting to do this in the modern era is that areas that were once plentiful with useful resources have now been nearly completely cleared out. And once again, was running into this here. No idea. No idea what I'm doing. Go inside, Andy. I'm good. Some sort of black mineral seems to be deposited at mostly just this. Oh, that's a spider. Yeah. I've pissed him off. Probably just shale or something. Oh. Something. Let's go. So next, I visited with an expert in every state in the tri-state area to learn more about this mineral and see if they might have some I could source. My name is Victoria Cote and I'm the Historic Site Coordinator here for the Dubuque County Historical Society. This is where our mine is. It is underground, about 50 feet. Galena was named Galena uh, as Latin for lead sulfite. So because of all of the lead here, we got our name. Did you guys want to ring the bell? You can. It's a hoot and a half. Don't forget to ring the bell. <laughs> Subscribe, turn on notifications. <laughs> oh, there you go. It's 90 steps down. In 1845, they did not have stairs. They would have dug a shaft from the surface, of course, into the mine, about 50, 60 feet. And at the top of that would be a windlass. The lower guy in and out, he would hang onto a rope. Oh, really? There might be a knot at the bottom so he can hold on with his feet or a bucket and he can put a foot in that. This is our lead mine portion. We do have mannequins. Fair warning. There's the Galena lead ore right there. When it's exposed, that's how shiny and bright it is. Approximately four to 500 million years old. So it's so old the dinosaurs walked on top, so no dinosaur bones here. Uh, and then of course the white stuff, this is all new coming in. It's your calcium-based deposits. And if you want to touch a stalactite, there's a chance, there's one right there. <laughs> that's it, if you go to a cave, they won't let you do that. And we're also in the Driftless region. About 30,000 years ago, the glaciers were cruising down. They came towards us and then went around us. And what that means though for mining is those ore deposits basically every day are getting closer and closer to the surface. So you could find ore, side of a hill, a 
cave, a couple of feet. You're not gonna find huge veins like this, like you would 50, 60 feet down, but you are gonna find deposits. And of course, the first people are Native Americans. We humans love that sparkly, shiny lead ore. What's the history of lead in this area? So because of the driftless area and the glaciers not going over the driftless and not crushing our land and not having all of these beautiful hills, the lead was still available right on the surface. And it was very prevalent in this area. So as Native Americans were able to settle here, they were able to just grab and do surface mining. And then they used that lead for different purposes from arrowheads to trading with first settlers that came to using it for their body paint. And then as European settlers came in, they started doing deep mining. We were originally founded in 1826, and then in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s hit our peak. Lead, it was first kind of discovered around here, early 1800s. The Meskwaki, who are the tribe in the area, their settlement was actually over by the mines of Spain. One day in the fire, they noticed this rock was melting. Once it was taken out, you could make it into anything you wanted. Then when it cooled, it was that shape until you put it back in the flame. The Meskwaki tribe, they were mining lead here well before the Europeans came. Some of their mines were actually used by Julian Dubuque and a select group of miners when they settled the area. They actually had a lead rush, very similar to the gold rush in California. When lead was first discovered here, you could actually just trip right over it. It was very much just on the ground and then it would go into deep veins as you went. There's actually a thing called a lead plant. And apparently it would grow wherever there was um, a vein because the roots would go very deep into the earth. So that was a way of finding uh, your next bit hit. So this is an example of a lead plant. Uh, I've been told that they grow where lead grows. As it would say, if that's true, there would be lead here. But over time, mm. most of the town's sources have been depleted mm. through the years of mining in the 19th century. So you don't just walk around and trip over it? Not like the Native Americans did. This is a badger hut? Yes, a badger hut, badger hole, um, whichever you'd prefer. The badger hole is actually very unique. You don't find this across the U.S. You really only find it really in Wisconsin and very small areas that border the state to come in, stake their claim, kind of get it going, so that way they could quickly gather up as much as they needed so they could go sell it and then head back home. Before this area was open for settlements, so in the 1820s, a lot of the miners across the river would come over here and they would mine illegally. The troops would be here um, in order to keep settlers from coming over, they'd kick them back across the river. So it's a quick grab and go. There were no real tents, you didn't build a cabin, you were just coming here quickly mining and then going back home across the river, usually to Illinois. You could find it nearer to the surface and that's how the Native Americans could do things like the trench mining, if you will, where they kind of dig a couple feet. They call them digs, but they're a bowl shaped generally, maybe a couple feet. Of course, when we have explorers and traders coming to this area, like Julian Dubuque, who was a French Canadian fur trader, basically they do start trading. So people are coming from other parts of the United States. They'll come here and they'll start mining. Then of course, word reaches Western Europe, but when the Cornish, the Welsh, and the English, when they got here, they could mine 50, 60 feet down. The area around here is pretty soft rock. Yeah, it's a lot of limestone, mm -hmm. uh, very porous, and the water can move very freely through it and does cause some erosion. What are some uses of lead? Originally, they started as paint, they started as lead pipe, they started as bullets. Today, we still use it as forms of x-ray protection, gasoline additives. 90% of Civil War bullets were made from lead from this region. Mm -hmm. uh, they used the lead and they shipped all over the country, Confederacy and Union. In order to get it from this state to here, you had to sell it if you didn't have some sort of shot town in the area. Yeah. So you would make it into these types of containers. You put your initials on it, so that way you knew your property, no one else could steal it unless they happened to have the same initials as you did. Mm -hmm. And this was how they would transport the lead um, to take it from their mines to the smelting or then to the market. It's very easy to work with. You can take this ore sample and you can put it over a hot fire. It melts at a fairly low temperature. A fire will do a hot fire. The sulfur that's in it will burn off which kills all the plant life around it. And then you can clear away any slag. So like this kind of stuff would be considered slag. It's just dirt and grime. And then you're left with your pure molten lead. So lots of very easy uses. Areas that they process the lead around here that 
cause environmental damage or? Yes, yeah, so we had massive amount of damage. We have old photographs of processing centers where they would smelt the lead down. And within a 500 feet radius of these processing centers, there would just be nothing vegetation wise. It was completely a blank slate. And even today, there are a couple of places where it's hard pressed to find growth in those areas. Going to mine lead, lead ore, you're okay. I mean, your general health risks, like you're 50 feet underground and it could collapse on you. That's a health risk. If you're smelting it, then you're dealing with the fumes, um, not just the sulfur, you know, burning off, but if you're touching it a lot, now you've got a problem. If you're using the finished product, you know, drinking out of the glass, eating a tomato off of a plate with lead in it, just a problem. But the miner themselves, that's not their, that's not their problem. So what exactly makes lead so toxic? The negative health effects of lead have been at least known to some extent since 2000 BC, but it's however continued to be used for large parts of history. Its use and health effects are theorized by some to be linked to the downfall of the Roman Empire. Royal cups containing lead in China are speculated to have been the cause of reported visions and hallucinations through lead poisoning. It was added as a sweetener to wines in the 18th and 19th century, it was used in plumbing up until the 1980s in the US, and continued to be used in gasoline in the US until 1990. The heaviest risks with lead are from long-term exposure, with developing children being the most susceptible to health consequences. Lead's toxicity is caused by its chemical property of wanting to replace other metals and molecules in the human body, which causes proteins in the body to change shape and no longer function as intended. This can cause disruptions of the digestive system, nervous system, respiratory system, reproductive system, and more, as well as causing developmental disabilities in children. So let's be super careful when handling lead and take as many safety precautions as possible. So now to head home and attempt to smelt some metal, thanks to a small sample I was able to collect at the Plattsville mine. First, use some clay to form some crude molds of a cup and some sling bullets. Next up, I'm gonna try and smelt some of the galena and make some actual lead. But I have a modern knowledge of the health effects of actually doing that, so I'm gonna take as many safety precautions as possible, protecting both any exposed skin and, most importantly, preventing myself from breathing any vapors. For maximum safety, I'll be doing a very small batch outside with a vent directly over it that'll suck all the fumes through it into a filter that'll capture any potential lead fumes. Then for extra precaution, I'll also wear a respirator rated for lead vapors and cover all exposed skin and be sure to discard or wash everything afterwards. For safety reasons and to contain any potential lead contaminants, I'm gonna do this in a barbecue grill so everything will be contained and I can just toss it when I'm done hopefully reducing any potential lead exposure to as small as possible. Lead is pretty easy to smelt because of its lower melting point, allowing it to be done just on a hot fire. Supposedly, when in need of lead shots or bullets, cowboys would just place a chunk of galena into a burning stump and the lead would form at the base of it. The actual reaction happening when lead is smelted is two steps. First, the lead sulfide is heated and the sulfur is released as a gas, while the lead oxidizes into lead oxide. Then, burning it with charcoal causes it to reduce into just lead metal. So to smelt it, I just combine the lead with a few layers of charcoal to help reduce it as it melts. All right, so everything's cooled off and settled now, so it should hopefully be relatively safe. Here's the contents of the crucible, and it looks like a lot of it did not react. It's actually still in the galena form, so it probably needed a bit longer to actually get most of it. But the crucible cracked, so anything that did form likely spilled out and can probably be found in the barbecue. So we dig around and find a few pieces of lead in here. So, looks like we did make some lead. Melting lead requires a lower temperature than to smelt it, which then has a lower risk of lead vapors. So I melted a larger quantity of lead with the small sample I smelted and cast it into my molds. There we go. Yummy. 
tears. So I was able to cast a really rough cup out of the lead and a few shots. I'm not super impressed with it. I wanna see if I can get it a little better by cold working it. And cold working lead is pretty easy. It's very soft and it's annealing temperature. It's actually just room temperature. So you don't have to heat it up again to soften it. Also means you can't work hard on it. It's as hard as it's gonna get. And now that it's solid, it's pretty safe to handle and touch without it getting any poisoning. However, if you consume anything, any lead dust that comes off of it, that's not gonna be good. That's potentially gonna poison you. Succeeded in smelting a little bit of lead and then casting lead to make this really crappy cup that is also poisonous. Possibly one of my worst casts. I should really redo it. I would, but I don't really have any desire to expose myself to any more potential toxins. I tried cold working it, that did not help at all. Lead is one of the first panels we learned how to smelt because at such a low melting point, you can just do it over a regular fire. From there, we kind of went on and learned how to make hotter fires to smelt new materials, such as copper and tin. But lead overall isn't the most useful of metals. Uh, it's not very hard, can't really make a cutting edge and uh, later we would learn it's very poisonous. So it doesn't really have many practical uses at this stage, except for being a heavy object. So we made some sling bullets, and Annalise has made a sling for the next episode. She's gonna try these out and see how much more it maximizes her distance with a nice dense metal. In the future, it'll be useful for things like radiation shielding, batteries, and a variety of other things. But right now, it's mostly just a toxic compound that with today's knowledge, you shouldn't really use in a lot of stuff. That didn't really stop people from doing that back in the day but uh, a little bit smarter now. So next up, now that I know how to smelt a easier metal, we move on to something that requires a hotter temperature, which requires charcoals and some sort of external air source, either from a bellows or a blowpipe. So I'm gonna do that next to try and smelt copper and tin and get into the Bronze Age. Soft lead was also used as a writing instrument by Romans, which means my cup and bullets can also double as pencils. Now with a mastery of humanity's early metals, native copper and smelted lead, we can now fully move past the Stone Age and officially enter the Bronze Age. My results haven't always been the greatest, but so far in the past 11 weeks, we've covered technologies that took humanity some 190,000 years to learn and master. But next up, we are reaching one of the early major milestones in history that helped greatly accelerate humanity's development, the Bronze Age. The ability to craft and cast this durable metal alloy and create significantly better tools and weapons is so crucial, I wasn't willing to commit to this channel reset until I knew there was a path for me to make it to the Bronze Age myself. Up to this point, I've had the historically rare advantage of being able to source and use native copper, conveniently with the largest deposit of such metals in the world relatively close by. However, the majority of the world didn't have this large access to metal straight out of the ground, and to get to the stage of extracting metals from ore compounds took some significant technological developments before its secret could be unlocked. To unlock the secret myself and learn the science and skill behind copper smelting, turning copper ore into copper metal, I paid a visit to the Butzer Archaeological Farm in the UK last spring to learn from their resident copper smelting expert, James Cliff. This process that we're using at the moment with the propane in antiquity would have been done in a bowl furnace in the ground with a toya, which is the air supply, pointing down from a set of bellows and run for about 24 hours with layers of malachite and layers of charcoal and you would have ended up with a bloom in the bottom of the furnace. But this is a much quicker process. So what we're doing is the same thing, but quicker. Due to his asthma, he uses a modern propane kiln to assist in the process, but the base concept will be the same when I attempt this later myself, more primitively. They do it in, in a large quantity. Uh -huh. So the, the, the bowl furnace would have been about the same size as a five gallon bucket. The tin has to be crushed down into a powder, separated from the calcite that way, and then smelted in the same way. The malachite, that's copper ore. So okay. we're, gonna, we're gonna do some alchemy today. They would have done a layer, same as we're doing, a layer of charcoal, layer of malachite, layer of charcoal. Is it just malachite ore that they would use, or do they ever use other forms of copper ore? 
Um, I've got some other copper ore, but no, because it's too complicated to get it out. I can't let you have the cassita right now, because that's rare as hen's teeth. Have you done this before? Not smelting, I've done casting. Yeah, well, it must have been very labour intensive. But they had a power tool that we, we can't afford. That's time. <laughs> and slaves, of course. You ready? It's like the surface of the sun. As I said last time I did it, it was molten and it just run everywhere and I just lost it all. So. That's copper. And these are bits of copper here. Yeah. Just let them cool. I think we've been successful. Next, he demonstrated how to cast the copper. We just melted into a replica of Otsi, the mummified ice man's axe. My hammer. Did you cast these? Yeah. Nice. That was a surprise when they found him in the 90s. He was 6,000, five or 6,000 years old. People didn't think we'd got copper then. But I'm gonna feed it from that end. So we'll pop it in there like that. And it's got to be Johnson's. Nothing else works properly. Wood ash, wood ash will work. My late father's shaving brush. Oh, we just fill him up again then. How'd you get on driving on the wrong side of the road? Then? <laughs> that has been a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> One of the hardest part is remembering to get on the right side of the car when I get in. <laughs> Good, so this is gonna be the pouring cup. We just smelted some copper, so that makes me an alchemist. Yeah. Nice. That's the size of Otsis? Yes. Ah. So it's an exact replica. Oh. It's like, it was quite advanced because it's got f flanges. Yeah. A lot of the early axes in this country were just flat. Hmm. So they'd slide about in the haft. Try explaining that to customs. <laughs> Thanks James, I now know the process of smelting copper, which historically puts me around 5000 BCE. When it's believed the process of smelting and casting copper from ore was first discovered, bringing in a transitional era called the Calcolithic or Copper Age in some parts of the world. And this was the era Otsi the Iceman lived in. These advancements in metallurgy at this time are likely in part thanks to the agricultural revolution which began as early as 10,000 BCE when humanity started to transition from hunting and gathering to sedentary farming. In our next video we'll cover this a bit more in depth as I attempt to invent bread. This change to settled agriculture allowed the eventual development of cities and civilizations and with it more complex trade routes and trading of knowledge that facilitated more and more advanced metallurgy. Eventually, it was discovered additional metals mixed or alloyed with copper would yield even stronger metals. Initially with arsenic and a few other metals, but thanks to the development of wide trade routes, it was soon discovered that the combination of tin with copper, two metals that are rarely found near each other, would together form an even better alloy. Some evidence suggests this happened potentially as early as 4500 BCE. The Bronze Age happened at different times in different parts of the world, and in some areas was completely skipped over. The widespread use of bronze in the official start of the Bronze Age is considered to be around 3300 BCE in the Near East with the early civilization of Sumer. This next period of humanity set the stage for many significant technological advancements we'll be exploring soon, such as the invention of writing, mathematics, astronomy, and even the wheel. But first, I need to enter the Bronze Age myself. I previously explored both areas with tin ore in Cornwall and copper ore in California, although both have been extensively mined at this point to exhaustion. It's Hen's teeth. As many areas of the world have. So sources of high-grade malachite and cassiterite that were once plentiful 6,000 years ago are now pretty rare. So I'll need to supplement my supply thanks to the help of one of our subscribers, Samuel Thompson. Now to smelt and cast my metals. Using only the technologies I've developed so far. First off, let's go through some materials and tools I've unlocked in previous videos that will be useful for this. Just recently, I learned how to start fire using primitive methods, the digging stick I cut and shaped using some stone flint tools, clay collected and processed with the help of said stick, my native copper axe made from rock copper metal we sourced in Michigan, bamboo stalks I previously collected from a forest in California, 
as well as cordage, spun from harvested wild hemp. The big hurdle with copper and bronze will be reaching the high smelting and melting temperatures needed. Previously, I explored smelting and casting lead, a metal that predates bronze, and has a low enough temperature that a standard campfire could be used. Copper, however, will require some optimization of fire to achieve the necessary temperatures. First, charcoal. Charcoal is basically partially burned wood. While burning wood while sealing it in an enclosed space, it'll burn without oxygen and only burn off initial materials and moisture, while leaving behind charred carbon that won't burn without the oxygen. This carbon is what burns the most efficiently and at the highest temperature, giving a very effective fuel. But to best maximize heat, you also want to maximize the other side of the fire triangle, oxygen. This can be done by forcing air into the fire, providing additional oxygen for combustion. Later in history, different forms of bellows would be invented, but it's believed copper smelting was first done just using blowpipes and human lungs. So using the bamboo I've previously harvested and at least worked on turning them into blowpipes. Since bamboo isn't actually hollow, each of these nodes is actually sealed inside, I'm gonna have to break them. And to do that, I'm gonna take this piece of smaller bamboo that fits inside, and I'm gonna sharpen the end of it so I can use it to force it through and break the nodes so we actually have a hollow pipe that we can use as a blowpipe. Bamboo is really prone to splitting anyways, and when you force something through the inside of it, it really wants to split like that. To fix that, I'm just gonna take some pine resin later, and I will fill it in the cracks, and then that'll work as a glue to hold the sides together and make it back into an airtight tube. Next, we tested the combination to see what kind of temperature we would be able to get with a combination of charcoal and blowpipes. Within a short time, we were able to get the coals to just over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, just hot enough to smelt and melt copper. However, sustaining that rate of airflow in that temperature for long enough to melt something would be a bit of a challenge. Historically, in depictions of Egyptian smelting, they depict up to six people on bellows. Unfortunately, we don't have the advantage they had in the past of, as James said, time and slaves. And slaves, of course. So we're measuring out the max wind speed we can produce together using an, 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 using an anemometer so we can make an equivalent substitution and avoid any questionable ethical complications. <laughs> The next challenge now will be a container that can withstand the high heat and hold the molten metal allowed to be picked up and poured into a mold. We've collected clay from a few different areas that would each have a unique composition and tried out a variety of crucibles to get something that this might work. really good clay. Yeah. It's like the best clay I've ever seen, straight out of the ground. Many broken crucibles later, we had some good candidates. Now to smelt some metals. All right, so I have the malachite already crushed up. This is uh, courtesy of Samuel Thompson. So with it, I need to mix charcoal to add some carbon. And as I learned in Butzer, this acts as a reducing agent, kind of attaches itself to any oxygen that gets released and forms carbon dioxide, preventing it from attaching to the copper as it gets broken down and that allows just the pure copper to form in little prills. So you can then pick out and then melt down and cast that. You know, just sprinkle it on, then add alternating layers of more charcoal to act as a reducing agent, and then just blow into it for about an hour or so. I'm gonna try putting the cover on top to help seal in and trap the heat, keep it contained. Just likely add charcoal as we go, and hopefully when it's all done, you can collect some little prills of copper at the bottom, collect enough of them, and you can cast something. Ooh, 
Oh, look at that. That is definitely metal. There's some more. I don't know what that is. Definitely copper. Looks copper colored. Definitely metal. Looks like a success. Got a container to hold all this. It's very pretty. Got a nice rainbow patina on it, I can see. What is that? That might be leftover malachite. Might have been too big. Ow. Big boy. Big one. That's very hot. <laughs> wow. That's a nice color. It's weird that it kind of retained the shape of the rock. All right, so I think I've gotten the majority of the copper. It looks like a lot of it has reacted. A few different phases it seems to be in. Some of it's kind of like a rock shaped and pretty crumbly. It looks like copper. It has patina on it like copper. My suspicion is it got hot enough to convert it and reduce it, but it didn't get hot enough to actually melt and form into a bead. We do have a few different beads in here or prills where it obviously melted. And there's one of the bigger ones. It actually worked. I don't know why I'm surprised. It's the exact same process I did. we did in uh, England. To actually do it over a charcoal kiln, something this simple, it's actually kind of surprising. I'm just gonna keep picking through and get everything that I can, then process the rest of the malachite. Then we'll do the exact same process for tin, and we can uh, cast something in bronze. So next up, I'm gonna make the tin. So we have a few pieces of cassiterite, basically the same process as the copper. I'm gonna put this in with a few layers of charcoal to help reduce it. Check on the tin. Looks like I might have some pearls here. So it could be metal. I think the outside of it should oxidize white. So that looks pretty promising. All right, so I got the copper and tin pearls in here. Ready to melt it down in this little crucible. Hopefully it doesn't crack. And cast it into this mold. the bronze fully melted took several attempts with small batches and even then it proved to be difficult to get it to cast before it would cool and solidify. Ah. Oh, like sparkles. For molds for the casting I tried using dried clay however quickly learned that they still contained too much water that would cause some less than ideal results. I then switched to using sand for the mold. What a beautiful board. My attempts at rivets didn't work out, so I attempted to redrill the holes using the bow drill I used to create fire and one of the copper arrowheads, but eventually gave up and moved back to using the pine pitch beeswax and charcoal glue to bind it with some of our cordage on top.
right, so with these two items, I am now officially entering the Bronze Age. I'm finding that I have to kind of relearn everything now with the new variables of doing it more primitively. So it's still a learning process. So while these are both are pretty rough, they are still effective tools to be useful for making future things. And as bronze are a lot harder and are already a step up from anything I already have. The native copper tools were a lot more effective than I actually expected. It actually holds an edge pretty well, but it does dull super quickly. And I have to spend a lot of time resharpening this as I go. It makes it a bit slow. The bronze should be a lot better and it's a lot harder, it's alloyed, should be able to produce a much stronger cutting edge that holds the edge a little bit longer. However, compared to more modern steel, they're still gonna be comparably soft, and it's gonna take a long time to actually get to that level of quality of steel. Even when I first get into the Iron Age, it's likely it's not even gonna be as good as bronze in the beginning, and it's gonna take a lot of refining to even match it. And then many centuries of progress to get to the level of hardened steel that we have today. To a modern person, these are not that great. But to someone in the Bronze Age, this is cutting edge technology. Can't get much better than that. This is gonna open a lot of possibilities for making tools, both with the harder metal, but also being able to cast it into custom shapes. Something that I was very limited with on the native copper. So for our next episodes, we'll be producing a variety of different tools to help us make more and more things as we progress into the Bronze Age. Something I find really interesting about the Bronze Age is that metallurgy for making bronze is pretty complex and was a bit difficult to figure out. But actually mastering this took place before a lot of other inventions that seem more common sense, things like paper, glass, written language, the wheel. These are all things that came after bronze and our future topics we're gonna be exploring. Entering into the Bronze Age really opens up the world into actual civilization and the evolution of society as a whole. So we'll be exploring some really interesting topics as we continue. So to make these two things, it took about 36 hours of labor to smelt the copper and the tin and then cast everything together into the molds and get some workable results, which I then had to finish. So it's about 36 hours. That's about $264 for both of these items. But these are based off of the evolving technology I've been working on. The whole process to get to here was 164 hours, which at about today's minimum wage would be about $1,300. So one Bronze Age for just $1,300. Just put that on the Amex. Next up, we're gonna explore a little bit more of the agricultural revolution and the invention of bread. For some bread I grew myself, I'm gonna make my own oven, as well as tools to get harvested and milled. Then after that, we'll be producing a variety of different tools, specifically with woodworking in mind, and uh, keep moving on through the Bronze Age. We've now officially entered the Bronze Age, a huge milestone for tool making, but perhaps not as foundationally changing as a technology humanity unlocked early on as well, agriculture. We're working on a series about building things Making the tools necessary to build them, it's easy to focus on the transition from stone to bronze tools being one of the first major changes of significance. But this overlooks the much more revolutionary change that preceded it and made it possible in the first place. The Neolithic Revolution, the transition of humanity from hunting and gathering society to sedentary agricultural civilizations. In human history, 96% of it occurs in this pre-agrarian Paleolithic era. But in terms of human population, 88% of all humans lived after it. Starting around 10,000 BCE, several areas of the world, independent of each other, began to shift to agrarian lifestyle. With the use of farming, 50 to 100 times as many people could live in the same area. This increased source of energy allowed greater complexities in human society with denser populations. This stimulated collective learning and innovation with more people exchanging ideas, allowing more advanced and specialized professions, such as metalsmithing, to emerge. In most areas of the world, one of the key crops that was domesticated was a grain which would quickly become a new foundation to the human diet. Initially ground and eaten as a gruel, eventually evolved into bread, a cheap staple food that would fill stomachs and build empires. So now, on our quest to rebuild civilization from scratch, probably one of the most crucial building blocks will be some bread. So I've been spending time growing many of the grains humanity has used. Wheat, rye, barley, oats, sorghum, corn, and buckwheat even an attempt at rice, despite not having a long enough growing season to grow it outdoors in Minnesota. So now I should have a good bank of a variety of grains for upcoming projects. Now let's make some bread, but first we'll need some special tools. A sickle to help harvest some of my grains, a chisel and a mallet to help shape some stones, specifically to make a corn stone, which we use to grind the grains up. Then some baskets to hold all the grain and flour and an oven to bake the bread. 
For some help making a Bronze Age era sickle, I got some help from Greg, the sword casting guy. He was in town this summer and we filmed a few upcoming casting segments with while he was here. All right, I'm back with Greg, the sword caster, and previously cast a few swords, but next I have some grain that I want to harvest. Ah. Can you help me out with making a sickle? As a matter of fact, I can. So wheat is, uh, is coming right out of the Bronze Age, and the early Bronze Age, they would have been harvesting with something like this. So this is a stone tool that they would have made, and farmers during the early Bronze Age would have been using this because they didn't have bronze. Like during the early Bronze Age, most of the military things. So um, farmers were making tools like this, and you can see where they get the idea because it looks a lot like an animal jawbone, and you can use that for cutting wheat like you're gonna do. And these are found kind of all over the world. This particular design is from Mesopotamia, but they uh, were using these like in the Pacific Islands, they would use shark's teeth in the same way. And that's early Bronze Age. By the later Bronze Age, some farmers, if they're lucky, were able to have things like this. This would have been attached to a handle, would be about out to here like that. They would have just uh, put it on the top and then wrap some, uh, some leather around it, a couple of rivets to go through there to kind of secure it and the handle's only about that long. So they'd hold it like that, and you'd just go like chopping. Did it mostly. Has kind of a funky little edge in there. That's all right. Kind of cute. And just like that, we stole their technology. <laughs> this is great. I just love that color. That's yeah. cool. That's not. That doesn't happen every time. I'm not sure what to say about that. Thank you to Greg. You'll be seeing him in a few upcoming videos where he helps with the casting of a few other items. Greg is a sword casting teacher who travels the country teaching group classes. And if you want him to come to you, just shoot him a message at his website, swordcastingguy.com. Now with a sickle, I can harvest some of my grain. So me and Andy collected some cattails during the summer and have let them dry since then. That's good because it means when I weave a basket with them, there won't be a lot of shrinkage and I won't get gaps for the flower to fall through. But that's bad because the dry cattail doesn't want to bend. When If I tried to weave with this, I'd just get a bunch of snaps. So I've soaked the cattail for about an hour in water, which gives me a piece that won't shrink when I weave with it, but is also pliable enough that I can make a basket. Next, casting a chisel and hammer. My first attempt with a clay mold failed, but was a bit more successful using sand. Mr. Bell, come in, come up here. This is the leftover elm tree from what we cut down for the bow. We're gonna repurpose some of it by making a handle for this hammerhead that Andy made me.
All right, so I'm gonna turn this rock into a saddle cart. To do that, I just need to hollow out a little dip in it along this way, which will help collect the flour as we grind it. While Annalise prepped the cornstone, I started processing of some of the harvested wheat by threshing it, by beating it with a stick. Now to grind it and make some bread. The first forms of bread were just baked flatbreads, made without any rising or leavening agent, which Annalise is gonna make by using some of the ground flour and some honey I've harvested before. So I'm gonna eat what people ate before we had bread to kind of show why the logical next step in food was bread. We have wheat berries. I can crack that with my teeth, but it takes some work. So humans ground it up into flour, mixed it with water and maybe honey if they had access to it to make a kind of porridge. It's kind of like oatmeal. Pretty bland, it's really only getting flavor from the honey. So I can see why something like this would be flattened and then baked into flatbread. You can just kind of like throw them in there. Stick this one on the side. Oh, they have a ways to go. Won't die. Very hot. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was doing. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I have the two breads that I kind of cooked more in the ashes that I already bit into, and they were pretty good. So I figured I'd test the two that I cooked more on the rock, but ended up finishing off in the fire anyways, just because it was taking quite a while. This one is the one sweetened with honey, and this one is just water and wheat flour. So we'll start with this one, and just so look at the inside of it. It's kind of like unflavored pizza crust. It's good. It's bread. And it's warm, which is right now the most important factor to me. <laughs> I'd eat it, like casually. It's a good snack. It definitely fill you up when your main concern with food was filling you up. That's pretty good. Yeast was a later development whose origin isn't entirely known for sure. But as wild yeast is present nearly everywhere, it's easy to imagine it getting accidentally discovered at some point. The invention of leavened bread and brewed beer share the same ingredients and rough dates of origin. It's hard to say with much certainty which came first and which led to the other. But we'll be exploring some potential accidental beer making in the future with some of my other grains soon. Either way, bread leavened with yeast began being made in Egypt by 4000 BCE. It quickly became the standard in many parts of the world. For my yeast, I made a batch of watery flour and left it out near our tomato plants. Yeast are attracted to sugary plants like tomatoes, so it should be a ripe area to collect some. After a few hours of exposure, I brought it inside to cultivate for the next few days somewhere warm and continue to feed it additional flour as we go. Check it out. Oh, look at that! 
All right, so I got the freshly ground flour and the yeast culture that's been cultivating. Got some water, got some honey. Let's make some Egyptian bread. Can I get a gluten? After kneading the dough, it's left to rise for an hour. Then knead it again, and left to rise once more. But to truly bake bread, we're gonna need an oven. Using our Minnesota winterproof mobile lawn, patent pending, we built a stone foundation, covered the interior shape of the oven in sand, and then used a material called cob, which is made from combining clay, sand, and straw. In our case, leftover straw from all the grains we harvested. After drying and hardening, the sand is scooped out and the oven is ready to be heated up by transferring in some coals. Once hot, we left the bread to cook for a little over an hour, occasionally checking on its progress. Stop begging. While we wait for the bread to bake, let's dwell on some of the negative implications of this innovation we just made. Bread makes you fat? Well, the surplus of food was great for building civilizations and advancing technological development to the average individual themselves, it was a different case. Archaeological evidence suggests that the switch to agriculture was generally a negative one to a person's life. With evidence of declining living standards, extra stress on bones from repetitive labor, and people overall usually getting shorter. Some theories suggest agriculture became dominant by people falling into a trap of sedentism. It's believed that it wasn't until global climate change at around 10,000 BCE that stable long-term agriculture became viable. And once a tribe settled into farming, their population would quickly grow too big to ever return to hunting and gathering. And they'd be forced to farm more and more to feed everyone. Then as history progressed, agricultural societies merely outgrew non-agrarian societies. And whenever conflict would arise, they usually had superior numbers to push them out, causing agriculture to quickly spread around the world. Anyways, my bread should be done now. Wow, that's actually really good. That is some good bread. All the mouth noises. Mm -hmm. Turned out pretty nice. So, if you wanted to make this bread yourself, how long would it take and how much would it cost? The answer for that is, it would take 71 and a half hours to raise your own crops, make the tools to harvest them, make your own grinding stone, grind it, capture your own yeast, and then bake it into actual bread. At minimum wage, that's $572. But for one loaf, that's only 286. That's not a bad deal. So overall, very interesting process. You don't really think about the grinding, the grain, which without a modern mill, it is pretty hard to do. Making the stones pretty time consuming. I don't actually know myself because I'd at least do that, but uh, it looked really hard to watch her do that. Uh, just going through the whole 
process, you can definitely tell how improvements to this were made along the way. The berries of the wheat itself, not very edible, but they're very hard. So grind them up into a gruel, it's okay. And then you bake it into a small little flatbread, pretty good. You can totally see how you could just accidentally leave it out and capture some yeast, and then that'll turn it into something that's a lot more alive and a lot more spongy. Overall, a lot more pleasant to eat. You can kind of tell it's kind of an accidental evolution that happened along the way. So we've made bread, and bread's basically the building block of civilization, and then the thing that kind of just destroys civilization, the other byproduct of this, booze. The cause and solution to all life's problems. It's not really known if beer came before bread or at what point, but pretty obvious to see how you can get that. We got this little culture of yeast. We're gonna let this guy sit a little bit longer and see if we get some beer, just to forget about it. Also follows some like 6,000 year old recipes as well. Made a few tools specific for this episode, but our next episode, we're gonna make a whole new batch of brown's tools. Revisit kind of how we did the melting of it with a little bit more efficient and more modern method that uh, was used a little bit later into the Bronze Age. Keep moving along in the future. Now we have bread, the building block for civilization. I have now just entered into the Bronze Age, but the results have been a bit messy and unrefined. So in this video, I will be making some improvements both to the method of heating my metal and the casting materials and techniques to try and yield some better and more refined results. Ultimately hoping to create a large blade worthy of a ruler of humanity's first civilization. In my previous video, I was able to break through into the Bronze Age by smelting raw copper and tin ore via the use of charcoal and blowpipes to get a high enough temperature to smelt and cast metals into bronze. However, this process is not the most efficient and took a long time to heat up the small amount of metal I tried to cast. The method also required a lot of blowpipe blowers. This is likely a similar issue faced by early metal workers who went through a few evolutions of process to make better and better metalworking techniques. So a few improvements could be made, such as better insulation to contain the heat. I used both dirt, sod, and stones in my previous attempts, however a few techniques can be learned from other fields. In my last video I made an oven for baking bread using material called cob that was able to withstand heat quite well and is made from clay, dirt, and straw. A similar lesson can be learned from the area of ceramics. Pit-fired pottery, as we've been doing so far, has been done for millennia, but it was eventually replaced by at least 6000 BCE with the kiln. The kiln works similar to the oven, and it insulates the area and allows higher temperatures to be reached. The same concepts with a kiln could then be applied with metals. Another alternative to manually providing oxygen through blowpipes is to build a furnace that creates a natural draft, or to utilize a natural breeze to provide airflow. A draft furnace works through air convection, meaning the action of hot air rising and cold air sinking. A draft kiln is built with a high chimney and a low opening to feed the fire. As the hot air rises out of the chimney, it creates a negative pressure within the kiln, pulling cool air in through the lower opening. This creates a constant flow of air into the coals of the fire as oxygen is continuously pulled in without the need of multiple people on blowpipes. This allows the fire to reach a higher overall temperature as well as the clay chamber having a much higher heat retention than an open fire or a bowl furnace. A later development that improved things even further was the invention of bellows. But as we've just entered the Bronze Age, we are still a good 2,000 years away from that innovation. So in the next step in improving my Bronze Age abilities, I'll be applying what I learned making my oven to construct a natural draft furnace that won't require as much extensive labor to get my bronze to a casting temperature and help facilitate casting of some larger objects, like a large dagger. First up, Annalise helped prepare an extra ingredient for our cob that should help improve its heat resistance. We're trying to make a draft kiln in crucibles that can withstand temperatures high enough to melt metal. To help us do that, we're gonna crush up some of our previous clay that we fired into grog to add to our clay sand mixture so it's a little stronger. That stuff's a lot powderier. I'm just crushing dirt. Another item that can be used to improve the furnace is a tuyer, a clay tube that acts as the opening for the inflow of air into the furnace and allows a more focused airflow to be directed further inward to the center of the coals.
Now to mix up the clay, sand, grog, and straw and start building the furnace. Due to the weather constraints of a quickly arriving Minnesota winter, we decided to build the kiln and modular rings inside that we could later move into place when we were ready to fire it up. This also helps with building up the height as the cob can only be built so high without laying it dry between layers. the kiln ring set and drying, the next challenge is the actual casting. Right now, we are at around the year 4000 BCE, and it's around this time that the earliest evidence of a method of casting called lost wax appeared. Using a wax like beeswax, the design of the desired object is carved from it, and then covered in the mold material. The wax is melted out, and the bronze is poured in. The big challenge right now is finding the right material to make the actual mold out of. So far, I've experimented with trying to use clay molds that have been left to dry for various lengths. Assuming it was the residual moisture in the clay, I figured firing the clay would solve the issue. And Annalise made a test mold of a bell to test it out on. However, the result of that cast still had issues with voids forming in the cast. For help finding the historical method used for the molds, I reached out to my Discord for help and was directed to some research that revealed the answer was right in front of me the whole time. Cobb or at least an explanation of what makes cob a good heat resistant material. Research had found that historical molds from the Bronze Age used unfired clay containing large quantities of crushed rock and other mineral fragments as a binding agent for the more thermally stable inclusions. So cob works well in high temperatures because the sand is thermally resistant, unlike the clay, which is only used to hold everything together. This same material was found to be used both in molds, crucibles, and the furnaces themselves. To test this out, we made another lost wax mold of a bell with a cob mold and was finally able to pour a successful bell cast. It's a bell. So speaking of a bell, this is your reminder to turn on notifications. We put a lot of effort into all of our videos. It really sucks to play to the algorithm and not all of them get viewed. The best way to support us is to turn on notifications so you see all of our videos and watch them. Ring that bell. So ring that bell and turn on notifications. With this new knowledge, I had Annalise also make up a new batch of crucibles using the cob that will hopefully be a little better than our last attempts. Now for the object I'm gonna cast. With the new kiln, I should be able to melt a larger amount of bronze and cast a larger object. However, we are still a few thousand years away from the invention of swords. At this point, the largest blades being made were daggers. So let's make one with some significance to this era. Heading out of the Neolithic Revolution a few millennia ago, we are now entering into the era of cities, kingdoms, and the first empires. One of the most notable was the city of Ur. Here, royal daggers were found in burial ruins, oftentimes made of gold and covered with precious stones. They were likely ceremonial displays of wealth and power. However, some of bronze have also been found. So after some pretty rough initial casts and making functional tools, let's see if I can make a blade worthy of a king. Now to assemble the kiln and fire it up. We got the donuts all stacked up, sealed up as cracks as best we could. Oh, 
full of charcoal and it's already quite hot at the bottom. And if you look inside there, it's like orange, red, glowing heat. Took a reading a little bit ago, it was already over 2000 degrees, which is uh, perfect for melting bronze. It's not quite efficient enough for doing iron at this point, at least. We have a little bit of advantage with the lake, creating a little extra draft to suck out from the top and hopefully increase a little bit more airflow that uh, makes it a little bit more efficient. I can definitely feel a little bit of a suction on the uh, two year. Not very strong, but it's definitely there. It's definitely working considering how hot it is down there. So we're gonna let this go for a bit more, get up whole thing up to temperature, then add in the crucible with the bronze. So after a bunch of polishing, here is the final result. I don't know if this is up to a royal standard yet. It's only my second digger. You can get better as you go. Yeah, so it was nice to make something that's more ceremonial and spend a little bit of extra time polishing it off and making a really good cast. So these tools are pretty rough. They have allowed us to make the tools necessary to make even better tools. There's not much real point in making it look really pretty when you're just gonna beat the crap out of it. So it's pretty easy to see that once you start building the foundations and start having tools to make other tools, things get a lot more efficient. And now that we made the furnace, we can reuse it over and over again. Now that I have tools, I can get a little bit better. The natural draft kiln worked pretty good. Didn't require any bellows or much effort once it got started, but still took a while and was still kind of slow, especially with the crucible. Pretty quickly got up to temperature, but getting the crucible and the metal inside of it to reach that temperature too took a while. And unfortunately, the crucible ended up cracking. Fortunately, they were able to make it work. Still a lot of improvements that could be made. So now that I've been able to scale up the bronze making ability to cast larger items, I'm gonna be making a large batch of tools with the intent focus of woodworking. One thing I have in mind is some casting flasks that will make some more advanced sand casting and get some much better results. That'll be our next video coming up. And this, including making the furnace itself, took about 35 hours or $280 at minimum wage. In our last video, we worked our way further into the Bronze Age by building a natural draft kiln. Now, with the capacity of heating and casting larger bronze items, it's time to start making some of the base tools I'll be needing for future projects. For my designs, I'll be looking for historical bases from across the Bronze Age era to replicate for my own. Bronze is a different metal with different properties and limitations, so attempting to replicate modern iron designs would be a recipe for disaster. My hope is that I can get a quality set of tools that will last me through the Bronze Age until we start getting into the Iron Age. So I'm gonna be aiming for some more high-end examples of tools I can find, so I can hopefully have some of humanity's best tools at my disposal for some success in this era. Of all the tools, most crucial will be some durable axes and a large blade for felling and hewing trees into lumber. I've already cast one axe earlier, but with a poor choice of a dried clay casting medium, it was pretty brittle and had already broken several times. So my primary goal in this video is going to be casting one of the largest axe heads ever found from the Bronze Age, a recently discovered large Nordic blade that's twice the size of most other blades in this era, perhaps one worthy of Thor himself. It's believed these original axes were buried as a ritual sacrifice to the Norse gods, so that might not be too far of a stretch. We'll see if this one can summon the Bifrost. Bring me that I'll also be experimenting with a method frequently used in the early Bronze Age of using a carved stone mold. 
But first, to learn a little more about a few historical axes and get some help casting a few, this summer got a little help once again from Greg, the sword casting guy. I'm back with Greg, the sword caster, and previously we made a few different swords, but now we're gonna make some axes. So you wanna tell me about these different axes you have? This axe is an axe from England. This is from the late Bronze Age, about 1000 BC. This is called a Palstave axe. You can tell that this is a very refined piece, uh, very symmetrical. This was made in a two-part stone mold, so they would have carved soapstone very carefully and precisely. And they would have preheated those uh, stones and then kind of held them together like that, and then pouring the bronze down this way into the mold like that. And the way this was attached to a handle, they would look for kind of an L-shaped piece of wood. They would split the top piece and like pad out on either side here and then uh, wrap rawhide around there to attach it. And the very earliest ones of these didn't have a little loop like this down here. You can imagine a problem with this if you're like jamming this into something, whether it's a chest plate or a chunk of wood or whatever, it could get stuck in it because an ax is a wedge. So you lose your ax head. So you tie a piece of leather to this and then tie it to your handle. Okay, that doesn't totally solve the problem. Like you could still imagine it like slipping out and still kind of hanging there. But if you survived battle that day, maybe you could fix it and go battle the next next day with it. Started out being used as a weapon because uh, bronze was mostly a military thing for, for a long time, but very handy as a tool certainly. So this one is a duckbill axe. This is from Mesopotamia. This is about 2000 BC. A lot of these were found around the ancient city of Ur in a cemetery. They were buried with warriors. So we know that they thought it was a very powerful weapon if they wanted to be buried with it and go into the afterlife with it. An axe is used as a countermeasure to uh, helmets or to armor. This would have been attached to a handle like this. Big step forward and they don't lose their axe heads anymore. Once you can put a handle through it and attach it with a pin at the top, you're not gonna lose it. It also doesn't have to be razor sharp because it's a fairly blunt object strike. So this would be like for a good whack like that. When you think Bronze Age, think small. Bronze was very scarce. They were very economical with their bronze. And so they would have made things just as small as they could have to make it uh, functional. Pretty, uh, pretty interesting weapon. We can definitely cast some of these if you like. The Bronze Age, they used a lot of different varieties of, of techniques. In the beginning of the Bronze Age, they were using clay. And by the late Bronze Age, they're using stone. And they were even sometimes using bronze like you can make like a pretty thick bronze mold if you have enough bronze laying around and when you pour that smaller quantity of bronze into it doesn't like weld together because the other bronze is so much cooler it just draws the heat out and so they'll pop apart from each other but stone is more common for sure and stone mode has the advantage that you only need to make the mold once right so it, you can mass produce weapons. So stone molds good for a certain amount of time and then they break. You know, and they like do lose some detail and you might use them for a while and then decide to make another one. And to cast this I made a, a little wax copy of the duckbill axe. Kind of scrape it off, put it back on, flip this up, and there it is. So now we're just gonna clean this up. It's thought that they were probably lost wax casting these. More powder. In the bronze age, they poured vertically, so that's what we're gonna do too. All right, that one's ready. Yeah. We're getting some great colors. I think you could just sell it as art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. That's good work. This is our most technically complicated casting of the night. Now, I hope some viewer is able to tell us what all these colors mean, like why that happens so consistently, because I don't know, and I sure would like to. You might have a little bit of this, but not, not to this extent. Look at those eyes, they're perfect. Like, that is just great. Tonight, we have just revealed to the world how to cast a duckbill axe. <laughs> Greg is a sword casting teacher who travels the country teaching group classes for casting your own swords or axes. And if you want him to come to you, just shoot him a message on his website, swordcastingguy.com. Now, to half the heads. Leather would be the preferred binding for these, but I'm currently planning on sourcing leather very shortly in the future, so I'll stick with the hem twine for now. Next up is work hardening the edges, so they'll stay sharp longer. Greg explained this previously when we made a sword together with a minor incorrect detail. Shoving the atoms a little closer together makes it uh, significantly harder. 
I heard that Edge Hardening is putting the atoms closer together. Is that actually true? Damn you. No, it's <laughs> not true. <laughs> no, no. So what's happening with that? I learned from all the all your uh, people who watched your, your earlier post, you're causing little defects in the crystal structure. And so those defects uh, amount to it being harder because you're kind of limiting some of the ways that I can bend. Then to sharpen and polish them. With the help of Greg, I have a few more axes to add to my tool chest. The next challenge for making my own is that I haven't quite achieved the technology yet to employ Greg's more modern sand casting method. Form-fitting pairs of casting flasks like his will require some milled and jointed wood. The tools to make those are what we're aiming to make in this video. So for mine, I'll be exploring a few more historical methods of casting with carved stone for the giant axe head. Now to do some casting. All right, so we got these uh, giant bubbles in it. It's not great. I'm not sure why that happened. Must have been some sort of gas coming out of, of the stone, I guess, but we were heating it like all day. So it was nice and hot. Shouldn't have been any water. So uh, I'm not sure what caused it. It's similar to the first axe I cast in clay, where it's very bubbly and causes bubbles. That one kind of just broke apart. Unfortunately, this mold is completely shattered. Only got two pores out of it. So I, I, don't, I don't know if sandstone just isn't an ideal medium. I um, haven't been able to find any good soapstone in this area, but I think I'll see if this works, see if we can salvage it still. Putting holes in ax heads was something that was done to save bronze. They're a little close to the, the edge. Maybe make it work, because uh, that was a lot of time for a mold that did not work very well. <laughs> One downside with using twine is, it tends to loosen with use, but I found that by coating it with the pine resin beeswax charcoal glue, it helps hold it all tight. Okay. Goodbye, Bill. All right, so thanks to Greg, we were able to cast these really nice, got the duck bill, got the pal stave ax here. Took these out and found out they are pretty effective. Really nice chopping tools, better than the broken one I made. This guy, also really nice. We actually took him out, cut down a Christmas tree. This is that time of the year. Did a really good job. It just cut really deep and really well. The voids here, not really an issue. It actually turned out pretty good. Um, it did break, but not where you expected, in the back. It was just on the backswing, it hit the ground and bent and broke this part. If you look inside, there's clearly was some sort of air pocket that got trapped, made it a little bit weaker. There's some obvious flaws with the stone mold that I haven't really figured out. There's also a lot of work, and that was just one side of a mold. Usually they would do two, 
they fit together. So I think I'm gonna move on to the method that was used later, but they use more of the cob mixture that we tried out before with the digger. So I think we're gonna do that for some other tools in the future and see how well that turns out. We use this to cut down a Christmas tree. It's actually looked up and the ax this is based off of. They found it because the farmer was gonna start a Christmas tree farm. Did a little search of the area to make sure there weren't any historical artifacts that might get destroyed and that's how they ended up discovering this ax. It's kind of gone full circle that we base this off of that ax and use it to cut down a Christmas tree at a Christmas tree farm. Making all of these took about 11 hours. A little bit of assist with Greg using his more advanced method. Not something I'm able to do quite yet because I haven't been able to mill my own wood and get it all joint together to form the boxes. So that'll be an ongoing challenge. But now that I have a nice broad ax, milling wood should be a lot easier. So overall, it took 11 hours or about uh, $88 at minimum wage. Not a bad deal for three axes. Bring me that off! I went for the head. With several bronze tools now in my arsenal, next up let's take the next stage in the control of fire and create the very first predecessor of the modern light bulb. However, we're still a good 6,000 years away from this invention, so we're gonna make the first predecessor to the light bulb, the oil lamp. For this, I'll need a source of fuel, build a machine that can apply enough pressure to extract it, construct a wick, and a vessel to hold the fuel. My goal is to produce enough light to work by after the sun has set. Let's see if I can pull this off. Previously, before the reset, I explored a variety of ways of making candles from animal fats, smells horrible, but looks good, beeswax, and attempted to chemically process seed oil. However, right now, we've developed ourselves up to around the year 4000 BCE, and are still just before the believed invention of some of the first forms of candles. Oil lamps, however, have evidence to suggest their use by at least 10,000 BCE. So let's start this at the very beginning, and for that, we'll first need an oil fuel. One of the first vegetable oils humans started using came from the olive. While visiting California a few years ago to film at a vineyard, we came across a patch of olive trees. To all my haters on YouTube, extend an olive branch. Stuffing my pockets full of olives before our flight back, I'll need to supplement my supply with some more olives to get a usable yield. So I'll be starting with 11 pounds of olives. If using a modern press, my yield should be around one liter but I'm gonna need to build my own makeshift primitive oil press machine, which will present some unique challenges. In the past, I've pressed a wide variety of different oils from sunflower seeds to cacao, most often using this simple device, a screw, which applies a maximum amount of force. Uh, unfortunately, with the reset, I'm now operating within the rules that put me in an era when only half of the simple machines have been invented. The classic six simple machines you may learn about in school are the inclined plane, the wedge, the lever, wheel and axle, pulley, and screw. Currently, we're at around 4,000 BCE. Only half of these have been discovered or invented. A few have already been utilized in our projects, such as a wedge and our various axes. And in a few videos, we'll be crossing a major milestone with the invention of the wheel and axle. But the pulley is still believed to be 2,000 years away, and the screw, 3,000. So to apply enough pressure to extract my oil, I've limited a few options. I can either use a really big rock, or if I want to maximize the force, I can use one of the other simple machines, a lever. I'm going to kind of recreate one of the old lever presses to try and press my oil. First, let's start by carving the base plate of the press that will collect the oil. The base plate of the press has a circular groove to collect the oil and allow it to drain in a single location. Then for the lever, I have a remaining portion of the elm tree I previously cut to make my own bow from. Next, I'll need some rope to tie everything together. So I've set up a very short rope walk here to try to just test make a length of rope. I've got three loops, so this should be a six strand rope. I'll twist each one individually, and then that should make them all wanna to twist together into one solid rope.
Most examples I've seen of lever-based oil presses use a stone wall as their fulcrum, which I don't have. So I'll try to make do with a stump and a heavy rock tied to the top of it. We'll also need some fiber pads to layer the olives between, so multiple levels can be pressed at once. Then layer wax to waterproof them so they don't soak up all the oil. Now to finally make some oil. The process is a two-step process. First, we start by milling the olives using the saddle kern stone we previously made for grinding grain. Now, depress the olive paste. The lever mechanism works using a lever in basically the opposite direction of a wheelbarrow, where the longer handles allow you to lift a heavier weight by lifting the handles over a longer distance. In the adverse, we are pressing down with heavier weights at a further distance, pressing down with much greater force closer to the fulcrum, meaning our 70 pound rock can be amplified to apply over 200 pounds of weight. Let's get back to the olives. Then the olive paste is packed between layers of the fiber mats on the press. The heavy stone is placed on top and then slowly more and more pressure is added by applying the lever with a heavy rock at the end. Then we just collect and repeat the process again and again. large amount of the juice that's collected is water, so after it settles, I can pour off and collect the top layer of oil. Now we just need the lamp vessel to hold the oil. Through most of history, these were usually done with ceramics, but I want to try something a little bit more advanced with bronze and create a more iconic oil lamp. And at least constructed one out of wax, 
that we can use the lost wax method to make a mole out of. After wrapping it in cob and drying, the wax can be melted out. A quick patch job with clay and then packing it with sand to reinforce any weak spots, we can hopefully salvage a cast out of all of Annalise's hard work. Then for the wick, using the one last remaining cotton plant I have from the batch I grew several years ago for a t-shirt. It's lit. A little portable light source we can take with us anywhere. And all together, it took about 28 hours to make the lamp itself, the casting, and processing all the olives. With minimum wage, it just got updated this year. It puts it about $230 to get this lamp. We went through about 2,000 olives, or 12 pounds. All together, we got a yield of about a little over 600 milliliters of olive oil. It's like almost three cups. With a modern press, you'd probably get about double that, so it's not quite as efficient. The oil lamp continued to be pretty popular. Candles were invented afterwards. Both were kind of the staple for lighting sources until the invention of the light bulb. This is more of a Middle Eastern style oil. It comes a few centuries later, uh, but it's a little bit more iconic as it's the genie lamp. You don't really think of it in this way too often, so I thought it'd be fun to do. 
But the olive oil itself is a pretty important item to be able to produce. It has multiple uses. It's useful as both a fuel source. You can use it to cook with, you can eat it. You can use it as a lubricant. It's useful in soaps and a bunch of other items. So very valuable and very useful and will be coming up in a lot of future projects. In the modern world, we are surrounded by squared, straight, and level edges everywhere. But in the natural world, such things are kind of rare to find. So that poses kind of a unique challenge. You might not think about day to day. If we don't have modern tools like a ruler, level, or a set square, how do you keep things from being completely lopsided? Well, let's look at and then make some of the tools the ancient Egyptians used to build the pyramids. First up, let's take a closer look at what these tools can build. The first pyramid was built around 2630 BCE, with the largest one of Giza, 2580 BCE. The Great Pyramid of Giza stood at over 481 feet when completed and remained the tallest building ever built for almost 4,000 years. Aligned to true north within one degree of accuracy, they are amazingly precise in their measurements. The four sides are equal within inches, and the base of it is level within almost half an inch. Measuring precision like that requires an accurate way to make straight lines, parallel lines, squared edges, and measuring level. So those are the challenges I'll need to overcome. The tools I have available to me right now are the hammer I previously cast, the knife, and the dagger, as well as the twine I've previously spun. To help us some fine woodworking, let's cast a few more varieties of wood chisels and a bronze saw. None of my attempts at the saws ended up working out, so I opted to turn my knife into a saw blade using a chisel. Be sharp. So the first challenge I face is getting a straight line. In nature, things like to curve. So getting an actually straight line is a little bit of a challenge. And one solution the Egyptians used was to take a piece of string, hold it tight between two points, and that would be a perfectly straight line. And then to mark it, they would dip it in chalk, coat it in ash or colored dye, and then snap it. And it'll transfer that dye onto the surface and you have a nice little guide. So I have a little bit of chalk from Dover I can try crushing up, but I'm thinking black might be a little bit more effective for what I'm working with. So I'm gonna try crushing up some wood ash to make a black pigment to apply to the twine so you can snap it and get some nice black lines. Let's give that a shot. Go play with the string. Crushing it, man. So now that I figured out how to make a straight line, next I want to find a good way to measure and compare distances and make parallel lines so I can cut straight objects pretty easily. So the tool I'm gonna to make is called a marking gauge. I can't have been able to find much information on its history, so I don't know for sure if the ancient Egyptians would have used this, 
but it's such a simple tool, it's hard to imagine they wouldn't have. Basically, it's just a stick that one end has a little marking spot, a part that slides back and forth and you can set to whatever distance you want. Most of them today use a screw to tighten it and lock it in place, but we haven't invented the screw yet, so we're gonna use a wedge to lock it in. So it's just gonna be three pieces, maybe the rod, the gauge, and then a wedge. So first up, we need to make a straight line using our chalk line and use that as a guide for carving up some wood. Try and get some straight pieces, the gauge can slide down. Boom. For the marking needles of the gauge, I cast a small blade using wax and cob. Use the blade there. So now, thanks to the chalk line, we're able to make pretty straight lines. With the help of the measuring gauge, I can pretty easily make parallel lines. So now if you want perpendicular, probably the simplest way that it might have been done is you just kind of eyeball it, get it as close as possible, brace it so it doesn't move or anything, and then you just do one side, flip it, and do it from the other side. That way, if it's off from 90 degrees, you kind of take the average between the two, and it should be pretty close to right angle. However, there's a few other possible ways to do it. Anyone who's taken algebra in like sixth grade or whatever, they will be familiar with the Pythagorean theory, Pythir Pythir Pythagoras. <laughs> Pythagoras theory of a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Simple math, you get a triangle with the right angle. Pythagoras came a lot later, so it's not entirely certain that they would have known that math. So another possible option they would have done is using concentric circles that will help you find a perpendicular. So let's do that and try and get a perpendicular line that I can then use to make a set square. So I have a kind of very crude compass. I'm gonna mark two spots. I want the line to go roughly right here. So I'm gonna do, do two overlapping ones. So try and do like right there and right there. Just enough room. Now we have the two circles where they intersect at the top and bottom straight through them should in theory be perpendicular. So let's get the chalk line and draw that line in. There we go. I would say that's pretty spot on. Next, to get some lumber and attempt to mill it into straight and square blocks to make the set square. Now to connect them, I'll use a mortise and tenon joint, a form of wood joinery that was actually found in some of the works in the Giza Pyramid Complex, and has been found to be used since at least 5000 BCE.
To make a wood glue, I boiled some leftover deer hide from the book I made a few years ago. When it's fully boiled and dissolved, it makes a nice hide glue that was a common wood glue for many centuries through to today. I have the set squared all glued up and I can use markings I made before with my geometry to confirm that it should be square. Next up, I'm gonna turn this into a plumb bob that will measure levelness. The plumb bob gets its name from the Latin word for lead, plumbum, as that's the material they were first made of, but I'm gonna use bronze. The plumb bob is also where you get terms like plumb, meaning straight and vertically level. So first I cast this guy, this is Bob. He's just a basically a pointed weight. It's gonna be added onto this and we're gonna tie it to a string and that will give us a vertical level. The challenge then is to go from vertical to horizontal, which is why we needed a right angle. I went through and measured the center point to drill the hole for the plumb bob, put the hole in there and the string. And then I can also find center here. And then I can use this to find a vertically level edge and a horizontally level edge. And then if you want to use it this way to find if a surface is level, I measured out the two edges from here, use a piece of string, marked them the same, and then drew a line across and sawed them. And then I can hang the weight here and put a mark wherever perfect level is and use it as gauge. Spot on, that's level. And also allows us to uh, do some math if we wanted to figure out different degrees. So if we are building, say, a pyramid and want to add a certain angle, you can get that marked and then have a consistent gauge for every slope. All right, so I have my completed plumb bob here and it's all calibrated and should be able to show both vertical and horizontal level. Yeah, so this is kind of the standard tool up until at least 17th century. And even today it has some use for a variety of different things for surveying and such. Basically a tool set the Egyptians would have had. So I'm gonna put these to the test and see if I can measure out accurately the dimensions of one average block for the pyramid. So I introduce a unit of measurement called the cubit, which was a standard measurement used for the Egyptians, the royal cubit, which was a specific length, middle finger to elbow. This is my own personal cubit. I'm gonna use it as a reference. And the average block was, they tended to vary a lot, but I'm gonna do about two and a half by two and a half cubit, and then one and a half tall. See how well it all stacks up. And uh, double check it with some modern tools and see how close I can get it. See if I can finally experience true level. Give it two half. One, two, cool. I think that's good. There we go. All right, so we have the kind of reference marks now if we were to carve a brick. We have a Theoretically perfect square on the floor of two and a half by two and a half cubit. Then we have the one and a half cubit mark here that is theoretically level. So here's a projection with our fancy technology of what that block would look like. This would be uh, several tons of limestone. Let's just measure it up using some modern tools and see how close I got using these ancient tools. My suspicion is that these can be pretty accurate, but uh, I haven't been able to calibrate them perfectly. So I'll see how close I got it. This is the one I didn't measure. That one shows some inaccuracies there. I'd say the three I measured turned out pretty good. It's the one I didn't. It's a little off. The carpentry trick to make sure you have something perfectly square is to measure the diagonals. And if they're equal, then it should be a perfect square. So we're about 72 and a quarter, 73 inches. So we're a little askew. All right, we got the laser level to really put it to the test. And you can tell. It's a little bit of inaccuracy there. Right, so overall, it wasn't the most accurate in my results. And uh, part of that is just a refinement of these tools themselves. They're still not perfectly straight. Learning how to use them, their sensitivities a little bit better would probably help too. And I imagine also when they were using these tools, they would often use multiple methods to double check and confirm it. When they make a square, they weren't just gonna measure three angles and hope the fourth lines up. They would measure that and probably also measure the diagonals. They were close, but not accurate. The surprising thing about this is just how difficult it was to get kind of the starting point 
point of milled wood and getting wood that's actually square. A tool like this will definitely be useful in the future for especially milling larger logs and such to be able to know if it's perfectly square. And you might be wondering, when are you gonna build your pyramid? The theories of how exactly pyramids were built and how long it took, most commonly believed is about 25,000 laborers over the course of roughly 20 years. So to do that myself, assuming I could move the stones and all the work myself, everything scaled, it would take uh, half a million years. So that'll be coming out in the year 50, 2020. So stay tuned for that. If I wanted to actually hire somebody to do it, uh, the most commonly held theory right now is it wasn't slavery necessarily, but agricultural workers in their off season were available and they were paid in bread and beer. And uh, so far I've already made bread. And next up, I'm gonna make my own beer. That's actually gonna be the next video. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. Today, beer is the third most popular drink after water and tea, and dates back even before the roots of modern civilization were laid. Home brewing today can be an incredibly complex process requiring specialized tools and equipment, but beer's initial invention is believed to be just by accident. So in this video, I'm gonna try and replicate the beer making process using some very, very limited tools and ingredients. Basically, just dirt and grass. With them, I'll be exploring three beers, an accidental brew, a rough replication of the oldest recorded beer recipe from Mesopotamia, and an attempt at a more modern form of beer. Let's Brew these up and see how they taste. First up, my arsenal. For the grasses, I grew and processed a few varieties of grass grains last summer. Today, we'll be using the wheat and barley seeds. Then, to help hold and sift things, I have another grass, cattails, that Annalise helped weave into some baskets. Then, for the dirt. We have some high quality clay we were able to dig up, and with a small bit of dry processing and sifting it using the baskets, could turn into some quality clay. Also in the earthen category is a current stone we previously shaped and have previously used for grinding our grains for bread. Then there'll be a few small exceptions for the rest of the recipes like some rosemary and dates. So first in the terms of tools, what we're really going to need is a few containers, both to prep our grains and contain them and to be able to heat them to the proper temperatures. And then lastly some vessels for them to sit in and ferment. In our process of building ourselves through history, we are still just before the invention of the wheel. So unfortunately, I don't have that tool to assist, which would have made making larger and more symmetrical vessels a lot easier. Also, if I had any experience in pottery since first grade, that probably would have helped too. All right, so got most of these guys fired now. Just got this big guy left to do in his own batch. At this point, we're still doing mostly pit firing, which uh, has a limited temperature you can get up to, which means these are all kind of low fired clays that are actually still porous. You do get a slight glaze accidentally, sometimes from wood ash. It's not really a high enough temperature to, I think, apply a consistent one. And glazes would come a little bit later in history. If you fill it with water, it'll hold it for a while. I'm gonna try and ferment beer in these long term. It's gonna slowly escape. So one solution they used to do is use pine pitch to line the inside of their vessels and that waterproof it. Uh, Greeks are known for doing that for a lot of their wine vessels. But I'll do these two for now. After this guy's fire, I'll do him. So then we can start fermenting our beer. containers now, we can do the first step for any beer, molting the grains. 
So after soaking and drying and soaking and drying these guys a few cycles, they've started to sprout and do the malting process, which is turning the carbohydrates in the seeds into a maltose sugar, which will then ferment into alcohol. And now that we've halted it, this should be sugar that we can extract out of it by putting it into a bath. So at this point, they all have little sprouts on them. I'm just gonna kind of agitate them and try and let all the roots fall through the gaps in these baskets, and then we can add them to the pot and start making the beer. Now for the first brew, the accidental one. Yeast can be found in the wild pretty much anywhere. So if left exposed, it can pretty easily start to propagate around any source of sugar. I previously did this to get a starter for my bread. It's believed that beer was likely accidentally invented when someone left out a gruel of malted cereal and came back to discover it had a unique taste and effect of alcohol. Since then, I've been cultivating my starter by continuing to feed it ground wheat malt. I was just leaving some stuff to rot and hoping you yeast. It's a little risky. So to test it out to make sure it works, I did two batches of beer using store-bought ingredients, kind of a standard brewing yeast for this one as a control, and then use some of my wild yeast and uh, let it go and ferment. And the end results were pretty similar. Both tasted pretty good. The wild yeast was a little bit more sour, which is common with wild yeasts, and I actually preferred it. So I think we're in good shape. I think we have a, a good culture to make some beer. So I'm gonna add some of my yeast to some watered down gruel and uh, accidentally make some beer. Next up, the ancient Sumerian recipe from Mesopotamia. Beer traces its origin to multiple places around the world, potentially as early as 11,000 BCE. But the first recorded recipe is a Sumerian song written down around 1800 BC as a hymn to the goddess of alcohol, Nikasi. The recipe has been replicated and interpreted a variety of different ways in recent years, but the most unique aspect of it is its use of bread to make beer. Here's one interpretation of the recipe. First, by using dates and crushing them, and adding yeast to start what would be more of a date wine. Then, some of the malted barley is ground to make flour and mixed with water and yeast to form a bread called babber. Left to set, it is then baked in our earthen oven, which we also previously made using grass and dirt. Then the bread and additional ground wheat malt are added to some hot water and left to sit for an hour. Then brought to a boil to sanitize it and after cooling added to already fermenting date wine and left to finish fermenting. Then for last, an attempt at a more modern recipe, but with my limited ceramic tools. First adding the malted barley to hot strike water and letting it soak for one hour. The hot water, roughly 155 degrees Fahrenheit, helps activate the last step of converting the starches into sugar. Then rinsing with even hotter water, roughly 200 degrees Fahrenheit, a step known as barging to help extract the very last of the sugar that's still in the grain. After setting for 10 minutes, strain out the solids, bring the liquid or wort to a boil and add the flavoring. To date, this is most often done with hops, but hops weren't used in brewing for another 5,000 years. However, prior to hops, a collection of herbs called a groot would be used. So to keep things simple, I'll use an herb that's sometimes found in this and I've already grown and have handy. Rosemary. After boiling, it is then removed from the heat and left to cool to room temperature. Then add to the fermenting bottle with some of the wild yeast. Now we wait a week or so for everything to ferment and hopefully not produce anything toxic. All right, so let these guys ferment for a little over a week and should hopefully have turned into alcohol. Let's open them up, give them a taste and see how they turned out. Hopefully not poison myself. 
It's got a nice color. All right, so we got the three final drinks here. Interesting, unique color to them all. This almost looks like a slushy. Disclaimer, don't do this at home. Don't let random things rot and then taste them. There is a potential for different molds and stuff to get into this and poison yourself. Don't do that. But I'm gonna take a chance. I think I've done enough precautionary measures to hopefully not kill myself. We got the accidental beer. Authentically, this maybe should be more like an actual paste rule. You can already tell there's a lot of floaties in it from the molded grain, but there's also likely some pieces of the pine resin that used to seal the bottle. And that should add a unique flavor to all of them because Greek wine was known for having that extra flavor. But it's pretty good. Yeah, there's not a whole lot to it. Very sour, not very strong. Almost citrusy, sour water, almost a seltzer. I guess it might be worth mentioning that uh, at this time in history, they wouldn't have had carbonation on their beer, so everything would be pretty flat. All right, slurring my speech. <laughs> <laughs> we have the Sumerian beer, how it was done about 4,000 years ago, known for being kind of chunky, and that's kind of intended. That's why they had actual reed straws, because they didn't have a good way to filter it, but it still has pieces of the dates. This is kind of a weird hybrid between a wine and a beer. The wild yeast I might have cultivated here could be different than what they had in Sumeria back then. So my results might be a lot different than what they had. Let's see if I can get the straw to work. There we go. That has a lot of flavor. That wild yeast again really packs a punch in this. Really nice sour kick. I like it. I think I've heard of it compared to a cider. I could see that. I drink this. And then my attempt at a modern beer. It's actually like Really mellow. The rosemary has a nice flavor to it. I don't know if I've had a rosemary beer before, but this uh, turns out pretty nice. It turned out a little weak. It's very smooth and easy to drink. Overall, I think that actually turned out surprisingly well. It might take a bit to get you drunk. The alcohol percentages were not the strongest. I think I'd say the Sumerian beer was probably the best. It's got the, the strongest flavor and got probably the strongest alcohol too, which is always good to have. So the whole processing of it, growing the grains, harvesting, processing, malting, making the ceramics. It was about 24 hours of active work. So roughly $195 at today's minimum wage and broken down for each one because we made three different ones, $65 for each of the bottles of beer. So yeah, it is possible to make your own beer out of just grass and dirt. My ceramic skills have obviously not improved too much since the last time I did them in first grade. Um, in retrospect, making some other tools like a funnel. Might have been a good idea. Now I know. In the end, I was able to make beer, which was a pretty important development in history and uh, was kind of a luxury payment made in a lot of different situations, such as for building the pyramids and uh, just uh, debauchery. All right, let's get drunk. Some argue that beer was one of the most crucial building blocks of early civilization. But when it comes to early technological breakthroughs, it's hard to beat the invention of the wheel and axle. This year is potentially one of the most groundbreaking and important discoveries ever made. The wheel and its axle. Of course, today it's so common and ubiquitous that we hardly think of its importance. But this design is found nowhere in nature and had to be completely invented by humanity. So today I'll be making this leap myself as well in an attempt to literally reinvent the wheel and use its revolutionary concept to build a few tools that were direct developments from it. The challenge of the concept isn't so much the wheel part. Rolling things is pretty straightforward and can be witnessed in nature. It's the axle forward to spin on that's a real challenge. That's why the wheel likely wasn't invented until 3500 BCE, after metal tools have been developed that can more finely shape the wheel and axle to the necessary sizes. Another event at this period that also helped drive this invention, literally, the domestication of horses and other pack animals. In the Americas, they had no easily domesticatable animals to harness, and the wheel never really took off, and massive empires would be built and run without the idea even spreading. There's evidence showing they figured out the concept of the wheel, but only ever used it for novelty toys. However, there was a good several hundred years from the invention of the wheel to its use with chariots and other forms of transportation. The first driving force for the wheel was pottery, likely first developed in Sumer and Mesopotamia, making symmetrical ceramic containers and other items led to the first forms of the potter's wheel. Just a brown base that could be slowly pivoted and allow the artist to quickly reposition their work. This then evolved into a slow wheel that could be slowly turned while working on the item. Then after a few more iterations, this turned into the fast wheel using a full axle to allow complete and smooth rotation. Next, there was the eventual attachment of what is called a flywheel, which would assist in maintaining momentum. For another example of the flywheel, let's make a tool I'll be needing in the rest of the builds a pump drill. Previously, Annalise made a basic bow drill for fire starting, which can also be used to bore holes. For a slightly more powerful version, I'll construct one that utilizes a flywheel. Nice X.
So with the addition of one of the utilizations of the wheel, called a flywheel, which by adding the ceramic disc and attaching it to the spindle, it acts as extra weight that'll capture rotational inertia, allowing it to continue spinning. That allows it to wrap back up the other direction, and then you can kind of cycle back and forth. So this should make this a little bit more efficient than the bow drill, a little bit faster to use. And the flywheel was previously used actually with the drop spindle that Annalise made before to help her with the twine. This will make it a lot easier to drill holes. So the concept of a flywheel is something that'll be useful for a lot of other things, including the potter's wheel that I'll be making next. Now with a push drill, I can add it to my assortment of other Bronze Age tools I've previously cast and made before. The assortment of axes, chisels, now serrated dagger, and hammer. I also finally had some success at casting a full-size saw now. With all my tools, now to make my own wheel. The potter's wheel was one of the first examples of industrialization in human history, as its invention greatly increased the ability to produce pottery. The importance of this tool becomes much more apparent to me since we did the reset, as I've quickly realized ceramics is very versatile and one of the few materials that have been mastered at this time period, where we're still before the invention of glass, steel, and the widespread use of many other metals. For my design, I'm gonna pull from a slightly more modern style, a Japanese kick wheel which I've previously used before in one of the first videos we made on making a ceramic bottle. One of my Patreon supporters, Dax, has previously built his own and wrote me up a great guide to help me build my own. The design is fairly simple. The wheel head is attached to a flywheel with the use of tie rods, and then the whole wheel sits on a mounted rod with a round rock between them acting as a bearing. So first to get started, I'll need to collect some wood. Several small and straight trees for the tie rods, and a large log for a wheel head and flywheel. My initial instinct was to use a slice from the log for the wheel head, as it'd already be a circle. However, Dax's directions pointed out that the rings are likely to break, and it'd be much better to use a cross grain wood. So I'll need to hew my log into some flat boards. All right, so it kind of roughly went through and hewed this log on the two sides to get it somewhat flat. I wanted to do that mostly to reveal what was on the inside and see what I wanted to use. It's got a fair amount of rot to it, actually. And that's kind of a risky take when you just grab a dead tree from the woods, which has made it a little bit easier to do the hewing. It seems to be concentrated mostly around here. See, it's actually got some nice spalting patterns, which woodworkers actually seek out. Um, but I think it's still salvageable. Some parts are softer than others. This area seems to be where most of the rot is, where this knot is, which I also want to avoid just because it's really hard to cut. So it has widest right here. So I'm gonna use that for the top of the wheel. And then I'm gonna use these two pieces here, cut into two to put them side by side to make a wheel on the bottom. And uh, yeah.
Boom. One piece. <laughs> Perfect fit. Not too bad, actually. Now for the tie rods, they'll connect the wheel head and the flywheels together. Never mind. That's not the right side. That way. snack for later. But then the glue holding my boards together broke. So I'll have to re-glue that again later, but for now, this might actually make cutting the inner hole a little bit easier. mounted rod, I need a strong and super straight pole for it. The best option I could find was actually what used to be your Christmas tree, which I had previously cut down for our Zygmuk celebration.
fish, maybe. Whoa. The easiest way to mount the rod is to bury it deep in the ground so that it offers a secure and solid base. All right, so we weren't able to actually bury it. Landlord wasn't too fond of us digging a bunch of deep holes. So we're gonna do a kind of a modern assistance with the mounting and uh, use a little bit of imagination to make this work. And now this is the, the mounting rod that the whole thing will sit upon. And in between, I got a round river rock that will act as a ball bearing. So I'm gonna grease that up. So I got some of the olive oil we previously pressed and use that as a lubricant, get this thing spinning. So there's a little bit of wobble because the hole in the flywheel is a little too big. So I'm gonna try wrapping that area of the post with some twine to thicken it up so it bounces around less. All right, so since we're gonna be working with wet clay on wood, put a little bit of waterproofing by applying a layer of wax on the surface. Rope is usually wrapped around the tie rods, so there's no risk of your foot accidentally getting caught in the spinning wheel. Something. Looks like it actually works. So we'll make a little pot here, it spins. So I think those, those are the benchmarks of success for this project. There's a bit of wobble, but it, I'm actually surprised how well it does work it actually spins pretty well. I also talked about adding cob to the flywheel to add extra weight, and that would help it spin a little bit more. As it is right now, it's actually pretty good. This is a really important invention in the history of humanity. Kind of tell why it took a while to do it. I suspect it took so long because they needed metal tools and a mastery of carpentry. The various tools that I used were somewhat effective. It was a lot of work. The fact that we didn't have an ideal starting wood was definitely a challenge. We had to find a dead log that was a little bit rotten, full of maggots apparently. It made things a little bit harder when using some dull Bronze Age tools. The milling of this to get it squarish was really challenging. Trying to do anything with actual precision with using such imprecise tools is really hard. It has some definite room for improvement. It wobbles. The circles are definitely not perfect, but technologies that developed out of the wheel are ones that will help improve this. I mean, just the fact that I can spit it now means I can almost use it as a lathe itself. And that was invented pretty shortly after the wheel. And that could help with the, the mounting pole and the other poles to actually get them perfectly cylindrical. Even with a little bit of wobble, and a little eccentricity to the actual shape, it's, it's pretty effective. I mean, the real challenge now is the actual pottery skills, which I don't have. The only pottery I've really done before this, five years ago we did an episode on making a ceramic bottle and we went up to St. John and learned from a professional potter. He ended up doing most of the work. He kind of just held my hands, literally, as I did it. Gone through some of our old footage and we put it on our secondary channel so you want to see a little bit better of a look at uh, how much he ended up helping me, how much I actually did myself. Um, you check that out on our secondary channel. We're going through some of our old content and new content and pulling some of the extra stuff that kind of didn't quite make the cut. So in the end, this took about 30 seven hours to actually complete. Could probably use a few more hours of refinement and everything. It's gonna take many more hours than that to actually learn how to use it. But it'll be an ongoing learning process. I did manage to make a little pot, I feel pretty proud about. But 37 hours, at today's minimum wage, that means it's about a $300 pottery wheel. Since we started the reset, there have been two major technologies that have been needed to be unlocked in our tech tree that we've been putting off. Textiles and leather. Two topics I've now covered multiple times in past videos and want to explore again with the new restrictions of the reset rules. My past efforts have revealed that this textile industry is easily one of the most labor intensive processes. And that was using modern tools. So now pushing the challenge even further and needing to make the tools ourselves, the initial goal is going to be unlocking these technologies by producing a functional quantity of the items, allowing us to supplement our supply with larger quantities for larger goals, allowing us to move forward without getting stuck in an endless grind. You realize this is only half the process. Half of the weaving process? Or no, half? half of the warping process. Oh. Well, first up, let's get some leather tanning. I've previously covered a few different methods in the past, bark tanning with deer hide and brain tanning pig hide using eggs instead of a brain. This time I wanted to try a different method, but with the most common type of leather, cow. 
All right, so for a source of leather, went to a local butcher shop to try and get some of their leftover leather from one of their cows they killed. So we don't have to kill our own. Didn't really specify what we wanted. It's like this is literally their face peeled off. I think they're inside out. Yeah, it's pretty disgusting. We have it now, so I guess we gotta use it. So I'm gonna try and tan these using a method called alum tanning, which is a compound called alum. This is a method similar to what was used by Romans pretty often and uh, should hopefully give us a kind of a whiter tanned leather. Some kind of electer stuff here. The aloe mineral is mixed with salt, olive oil, egg yolks, and flour to make a nice gooey paste that you could almost bake into a cake. Then they are left to tan for several weeks. Now for the extra challenging process of making textiles. First, I need to grow the flax. Over the past summer, they grew into short little bushes with small, pretty little flowers on them. As they progressed, they turned into pods containing the flax seeds, something we've already been able to put to use in a few projects before. But for textiles, it's the stalks I'm after. ended up growing two slightly different varieties of flax, which were ready to harvest at different times. So I had to harvest them twice. Once harvested, the next process is called rutting, where you let them start to decompose, which helps separate the inner core from the outer core we're after. While they sit and ret, let's prepare some tools for the next process. For the last project involving cloth making, I was able to get some extra assistance with Annalise to help construct a loom. But at the beginning of the year, she moved on to pursue a job more aligned with her personal goals. And we've been in the process of looking for a potential replacement since. But in the middle of that process, the global pandemic of COVID-19 struck, and we decided to split up these tasks between the couple of potential candidates and see how well they handled the difficult challenges of this job. I have a tattoo of a corn dog, so you know I'm, you know I'm real. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> my name is Lauren. I'm here with this flax and how to make everything to teach you how to heckle. So this is a heckle. It looks like a medieval toothbrush, but it's not. We're gonna be making one from scratch, casting bronze out of beeswax. And eventually when we make something similar, we're gonna be taking the flax and raking it through the spikes to make a soft uh, material that we can make clothing out of. So hopefully it works and we'll be able to make like a shirt, pants, shorts, whatever we feel like. Oh my gosh, <laughs> just broke right away. I hate myself. Oh my god, maybe it'll work still. Well, I may as well use that. Oh my gosh, this is so nerve-wracking. Uh, it's gonna work. This looks like a cheap um, advertisement for Monster. <laughs> <laughs> my stick broke. Oh. Perfect heckle. Just don't look at it. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> it's on fire. <laughs> Should we put out the fire? <laughs> Big reveal. Oh, kind of. It's so cool. Oh my god, I love it. That's so cool. It's like a radiator. <laughs> Why do I want to touch it so bad? <laughs> Meanwhile, for the upcoming weaving portions, Kate started to construct the new loom, a warp-weighted loom. <laughs> Nature! Ooh, hello. That, that might work. That looks good. Oh, well, look what I found. An armchair. It's like Urban Wicker Man. I'm gonna make a sacrifice <laughs> to the gods. One of the oldest and earliest looms dating back well into the Neolithic era, its construction is pretty straightforward. Warp loom. This is what I've got so far. This will be the frame. It's basically two uprights, a Y crotch at the top, the cloth beam, which is the straightest bit of wood you can find. I'll be cutting it off on either end and shaving this down so it's nice and smooth. This is what the cloth will be hanging from. And then I can secure it around here with a bit of rope, maybe some small pegs, see what it needs. At the bottom, we've got the biggest piece of wood will be the shed bar. That is what half the fibers will drape over while the other half will be dangling behind. 
weighted with our loom weights. Please don't fall apart, please don't fall apart, please don't fall apart. 5,000 years ago, they would have no way of knowing if this was level, so. Beth, hello, <laughs> look at that. Boom shakalaka. With just enough lead time, we were able to get both of them prepared and set up just in time as our state went into full lockdown and shelter in place. And they were able to continue forward from home. This is Winky. Winky. She's gonna help me. All right, let's go. Okay. Okay, so first I guess we have to take this and break it up. gets rid of all the short stuff and hopefully we'll just leave behind the longer fibers. Welcome to my home. That's Pluto. Now just to get the shape I'm gonna add my cloth beam. Oh, good job. Good job. One more to secure. Get my heddle sticks and bash them into place. Taking the heckled flax from Lauren, Kate could then spin it into a thread with a drop spindle and start weaving. So now we're at the point where we gotta string this thing up. Hope the cat doesn't attack this. String one. <laughs> That's five. There we go. So I just have to do that about, let's shoot for 20 more times. Loop. Bloop. Yeah. So my next step today is separate out each individual strand. I can then string all my little bits of string, attaching each individual one to the heddle bar using these little shorter strips of flax thread. My shuttle here, which I will use to pass through the loom, which will be going through the warp, which is the threads going vertically. Yeah, so that's the last of that added to my shuttle. So, Let's do this. Oh, hello. Yep, that's, oh. And I send this back, unroll a bit, weave through. This is gonna be a sheer tunic. about an hour's worth of weaving. It is a much, much tighter weave than I was getting initially. I'm pretty proud of what I've made. Her name is Kindling. I did get a panel the width I wanted, but not the quality I wanted. I put a much narrower panel of fabric. This, shockingly, is roughly half the same amount of warp. Just scrunched very closely together. Um, and I think it's working a lot better. What I really want out of this is to make something comparable to what this, this material, the style of loom could make in the part of the Bronze Age that we're in. So yeah, I'm just gonna spend the day power weaving, possibly a belt or a headband out of this guy. One is, you know, a rustic table setting. And then I've got this little guy, which there's not much of it, but I'm very proud of it. This is a monumental thing for humans to have figured out. <laughs> Thanks to Kate and Lauren, we were able to finally unlock textiles. Let's check out those morbid cow heads and see if they actually got preserved. It's been several months now, left these to tan and surprisingly have not rotten, so it means they've been preserved. They've gotten rock hard though, not gotten any easier to use. I did take one of these, cut it open, and then I've been working it with a bit of oil to soften it up. It's still pretty stiff, which actually works pretty good for the purpose of armor that we're going for. Managed to get at least a small piece of functional leather from each of these heads. It is leather, not a huge quantity, probably five or six of these out of it, so probably enough to make like a 
another really weird football, less hairy this time. For now, I'm gonna consider this unlocking the technology of leather making. Uh, it's something we've done a few times with different animals and different methods. And with that, we complete many of the major technological achievements of the Stone and Bronze Age, setting the stage for reaching the next major era of the Iron Age. The results may not always be the prettiest, but these achievements represent the building blocks of everything that will come next. As we continue to move forward, things will get more and more developed and refined as our tools continue to improve. In the next marathon edit, we'll cover the next major development achieving high enough temperatures to smelt and work iron.